Yes, good evening. Welcome back. As I promised, we're going to start promptly at 630 because there's a lot of material tonight and we'll have a lot of discussion afterward, I'm sure. Uh, the only introduction I'll make is our rotating council member representative this week is Mayor Pro Tem Neil Ferguson. Unfortunately, Mr. Ferguson couldn't join us in person. He is joining us, however, online. So thank you, Mr. Ferguson, for joining us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Deaver. That was quick. Thank y'all for allowing us to, to present this to you today. I brought some back up to, tonight. So over here uh, in the B shirt, I have Sergeant Lee Noble. He is over our traffic division. And he was instrumental in a lot of the early training that we did in non-biased policing. And he will be uh, presenting some of that later on. And then Courtney Latalia. She is one of our patrol sergeants and she's been here 108 years. <laughs> it probably seems like that at times. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my PowerPoint is made up of all the questions that you all have submitted or things that I have heard over the last few weeks. So I'll do my best to answer all of your questions. Uh, if you do have any questions along the way about something that I'm specifically talking about and you want to go ahead and ask it, by all means ask it. If it's something that I may get to later on, if you want to just hold off and wait until, uh, until that point. <clears throat> so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was give you our mission statement. Through a partnership with the community, the Through a partnership with the community, the mission of the Louisville Police Department is to solve problems and improve public safety in a manner that is fair, impartial, and transparent. And our core values are service, integrity, and professionalism. And most chiefs, whenever they come into office, they, they like to implement their own core values and their own mission statement uh, to kind of set the tone of how that administration is going to work. So I based our... My clicker's not working. There we go. So I based our mission statement on the pillars of procedural justice. And that, that's the training that, that we're going to start this next year that I believe is really important. And it really ties directly in with non-biased policing. Um, and that is that we treat everyone fairly. We let everyone be heard. We be as transparent as possible. And we be impartial in your treatment of others. So that's what we stand by. I know uh, you had HR last week and they got into a lot of things with you all, but I wanted to show you the demographics of all our levels of, su of supervision. So the first one here is the first line supervisors, and that consists of sergeants and civilian supervisors, and there are 32 employees at that level. 78% of those are white, 12 are black, and six are Hispanic and 4% are Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. The next level is our mid-level supervision, and we have nine employees at that level, and they consist of captains and coordinator positions. 67% of those are white, Hispanic and black each have 11%, and I still have one vacancy to fill. The command staff is four employees, it is me, two assistant chiefs and one civilian manager, and they are 100% white and one female. So I wanna go into our hiring standards a little bit. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a, are the TCO classifications for certified officers. So anytime an officer leaves a department to go somewhere else or just completely get out of it, we have to classify how they separated from the department. And that's what these are. This is what Melinda talked about it either last week or the week before, the F5s. So this is what goes on the F5. Uh, some agencies use these classifications as negotiating tools when, they're, when someone is separating from the department. We don't do that. We strictly follow the, the guidelines by TECO. So you see the three are honorable discharge, general discharge, and dishonorable discharge. We'll start with honorable. 
So that is someone that is retired or resigned while in good standing and not because of pending final disciplinary actions or documented job performance. A general discharge, the person was terminated, retired, or resigned related to a disciplinary investigation of conduct that is not included in dishonorable or was for a documented performance problem. And in dishonorable discharge, person is terminated, retired, or resigned in relation to allegations of criminal conduct, insubordination, or untruthfulness. And once again, I remind you, I think I mentioned it a few weeks ago, but we only hire honorably discharged they come departments. So these are our LPD hiring standards, and I kind of talked about these uh, uh, last week, I believe. A lot of these are minimum standards. So they must be 21 at the time of graduation from the academy. They must be a U.S. citizen. They must pass a pre-employment drug screen, a physical exam, polygraph, and they must be able to distinguish between red, green, and blue. They must have a valid Class C driver's license. They must pass the physical ability test and then the, the comprehensive background and then a psychological exam. So we, we now have broken our hiring procedures out into two different categories. So we hire certified officers and then we also uh, hire police cadets. And those are the ones that we want to send through the academy. So the police cadets, they have to pass a written examination before we will hire them to go to the academy. And Melinda mentioned that last week. That's to make sure that they have the, uh, the knowledge, skills, and ability to pass the state test. Uh, the other thing that we've changed recently is we, uh, we went from a physical ability test of running, climbing stairs, and dragging a dummy to a, to a row test that's on the Concept 2 rowing machine. You all have probably seen that machine at gyms and things like that. And we, we were not alone in this. A lot of departments went to this, including uh, the Department of Public Safety. They now use that as their hiring standards. And we, we went that direction because we believe it more accurately determines the uh, person's fitness to be a police officer. So here's some examples of rejections, and I know I talked about this last week, but the one thing I wanted to mention uh, why we have these, st uh, these standards or these rejections, uh, and it's all about officer credibility. You know, if someone has lied to us in a background process, then we cannot trust them that what they put in an in a offense report is going to be 100% truthful. Along those same lines, if a person sold drugs in their lifetime, and you know, can you imagine that person going to court and testifying against a person that they arrested for selling drugs? If the defense attorney knew that was in that person's background, then they would bring that up to discredit that officer. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk about community outreach. Uh, and I want to talk about the true purpose of a lot of these. So I'll run through the, the list first. So you see Citizens Police Academy, Citizens University, Coffee with Cops, Adopt-A-School, the Neighborhood Resource Program, uh, SRO School Resource Program, Social Media, National Night Out, Presentations to Civic Groups, Explorer Program, Car Seat Installation, Career Days, and LISD events. So we do a lot out in the com community. I want to talk about a couple specifically, and one is the SROs. So the true purpose of the SRO is to get officers into schools to build those relationships and mentor, mentor students. Uh, there's been some issues with SROs across the nation where they've kind of overstepped from that. And a lot of it is because the, the school district that they work for put them in that position. We're not there to enforce school discipline and things like that. So uh, a few years ago, the state legislature actually passed law, laws that dictate which offenses we can enforce on school grounds. Uh, it, there were some agencies, even in Texas, where, uh, instead, where something was treated as a criminal matter that could have been a discipline matter. And one example is a, a student that is disruptive in class. You know, when I was in school, I got sent to ISS is what it was called then. Uh, I never got to go, but uh, that's where people went. But we had some school districts in Texas that they would call the SRO in and the SRO would give that kid a citation for disruption of class. 
And, you know, we, we never did that here. We never had issues with it. I think our school district works well with our SROs and understands why they are there and, and when to utilize them in the correct manner. Uh, we also worked with a career center with LSD, and we helped teach a practicum for uh, kids that are interested in going into the law field. And it may be law enforcement, they may have plans of being an attorney or something like that. On average, it's about 15 students per year, and the program lasts three months, and the kids rotate between law enforcement agencies or law firms to uh, kind of get some on-the-job experience, figure out if that's really what they want to go into or not. Uh, and then the, those students, they, they shadow our officers, they'll, they'll work with a detective or crime scene people and things like that in, in a controlled setting. I know we've talked about the Explorer program, but I, uh, someone asked, so I'm trying to answer all the questions you all ask. Uh, so we have hired seven people that started out in our Explorer program. So that's pretty good. I know some of our Explorers have went on to other agencies and, and didn't come to work for us. And we've hired a bunch of people that were in other Explorer programs that eventually came to us. And I wanted to give you the uh, on our Explorers. So we currently have 10 white Explorers, six Hispanic, and two black. 10 are female and eight are male. The next topic I want to talk about is services to the vulnerable. Uh, so in Texas, people out of homeless. That's a remarkable stat when I saw that. And that's from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Many of those homeless people are also dealing with mental or substance abuse. And those are the two biggest issues facing law enforcement today. Uh, we average between about 80 to 100 home ho homeless people on a daily basis. And uh, we also work with, I'm sorry, I forgot to advance the slide. Uh, we're also working closely through some committees with the, the Denton County Behavioral Leadership Team. I know I'm on it, Ms. Goller's on it, Commissioner Mitchell is on it. And what we're trying to do everything from a holistic approach and, and really try to find those solutions at the county level that local communities. And then we all participate in the, the jail diversion committee. Uh, a lot of times, the course they have is to arrest someone. So uh, we're looking at jail diversion and, and trying to, there are some models out there from uh, several areas around the state that we've looked at. And uh, the premise for that is that those people go into a jail diversion center instead of the and then they work through some sort of substance abuse court or something along those lines county jail. So hopefully we will uh, we'll here for those people. So it's kind of a new concept dealing with mental illness. It's really, really phenomenon. Me doing that or <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a relatively new phenomenon that police had to get involved with. Doing it, so we were kind of thrown into the situation of dealing with homeless. And you want me to take that one? Can you hear me now? Testing. So um, it, it's a relatively new phenomenon that, that police departments have had to adapt and, and get involved with because, quite frankly, there was no one else doing it. And uh, that's often what happens is when there's a, a societal problem that no one else is dealing with, it becomes law enforcement's problem. So there are some models out there that, uh, you know, we, we do the uh, Neighborhood Resource Officers Homeless uh, Outreach Program. We've got a, a NRO that really is excited about doing that. He he helps the homeless people get them get get them in touch with the resources that they need to try to get them out of homelessness, uh, and and refer them to the people that they need while also helping out the community and the, the business owners. 
So one particular model that, and I've got several I want to talk about, uh, but the first is Irving. They established what they call a mental health response team. It's a multidisciplinary team comprised of officers and civilians. It has one sergeant, three officers, and the civilian is a civilian mental health clinician. And they deal with all mental, mental illnesses, uh, substance abuse, and behavioral health issues. Another one that's out there is a Plano Police Department. They have a crisis intervention team, and it's based on a Memphis PD model, and uh, it, it's based on increasing collaboration between police, mental health providers, advocates, and families. And I think that's pretty close to what we do with our NRO program. We just don't have a dedicated unit that does that or civilian staff that help with it. Fort Worth, they sent their officers to specialized training and they are now mental health crisis intervention officers. Uh, and the, the, the training is pretty extensive. They, a lot of times they wear plain clothes so that they uh, don't look so intimidating to, to people that may be in a mental health crisis. Uh, I don't know if you saw it on the news or not, but just last Tuesday night, this unit actually encountered a person in mental health crisis and that person ended up pulling a gun and they ultimately had to shoot him. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of talk out there about defunding the police and civilianizing things. It's not a, a simple solution. You've still got safety issues that have to be dealt with and, um, and I think law enforcement still has to be involved in that at least to some level. So with that, I will turn it over to Sergeant Noble and he's gonna walk you through uh, some of the training that we do. How y'all doing? Can y'all hear me okay? Well, really, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I can tell you that I, I did a little bit of research. Um, uh, I watched the other videos of you guys. So I got the benefit of watching the recordings of these meetings. So. I know a little bit about you guys as far as you know, the conversation that y'all had, you know, they know about the link with the meetings on it, right? The links with the meetings? Okay, good. All right. Yeah, you guys are movie stars right now, okay? Uh, so I, I appreciate you guys uh, allowing me to speak with you guys today. Uh, a couple of people I know, Miss Bobby, how you doing? Uh, and uh, you bought me lunch back there, sir. Remember me? Yeah, over at the uh, Corner Cafe. I was in uniform, thank you, I appreciate that. I was hungry that day. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on me real quick. Um, I've been with uh, Louisville for 17 years. Uh, 17 years next month, I gotta be precise because they have all the numbers. Uh, yeah, they'll go back and say, he lied, but anyway. Uh, no, you won't. Um, I've, uh, I'm a retired Air Force uh, Master Sergeant, for anybody that knows anything about the military. Um, I did a few interesting things, because I, went, I heard your backgrounds, I was super impressed with uh, Dr. Petaway's, uh, I mean, it was so much stuff, the business, uh, franchises, the insurance companies, the ministries, the principals, the teachers, uh, all of that, I was just super impressed with that. So I don't have a whole lot to offer in that arena. But uh, just to give you, to let you know how I ended up in law enforcement, is that okay? I'm telling? Okay. Well, I'm a, I'm a runaway from, I'm an unreported runaway from a home uh, that involved a lot of violence. Uh, my father murdered three people. Uh, my mother murdered my stepfather, who was a pimp. Uh, the, um, it was a lot of violence. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I've dealt with a lot of uh, physical abuse. I got the scars to prove it, and it motivates me every day. And that's why I'm in law enforcement. I ran away from home at the age of 15 and a half. Uh, ran away to the state of Alaska uh, from Texas, so I didn't have to come home. I wanted to make it on my own. I didn't want to go the wrong, wrong route. Graduated from West Anchorage High School. Lied my way all the way through high school, telling them my parents were there, and they found out about two weeks before graduation. So they let me graduate because I'd already uh, delayed enlisted into the Air Force, and that was my goal, to get in the Air Force. Um, joined the Air Force, let my family know where I was. They didn't report me because they were all felons, so I knew that I would be able to, won't be brought back home. Um, joined the Air Force, uh, became a dental technician, ended up doing facial reconstruction in the OR. I was a forensic technician in the OR. 
worked plane crashes for, with the NTSB, and all of that was so I wanted to be a detective, I wanted to be a police officer. So I took that route, did 20 years, retired. Uh, I was hired by DPS first, and I was lucky enough to get a call from Louisville asking me if I still wanted a job. I was thankful because I didn't want to wear a cowboy hat. <laughs> but uh, I don't look, no, she'll tell you. I don't look good in cowboy hats. So, uh, but I was going to do what I need to do to become a police officer. Uh, Louisville hired me, uh, took the job immediately. Uh, I haven't had nothing but good experiences here. Um, I met a lot of wonderful people. I've done a lot of things. Um, I speak to uh, boys to men programs and the chief didn't know anything about that. I've been doing that for about 15 years because I didn't want him to feel that uh, it was associated to the police department, which he wouldn't have minded, but I wanted to go as Lee Noble. I, this is Lee Noble. I came as myself today, okay? So today, the person that's talking you, to you today is going to be Lee Noble, who works for Louisville Police Department, not Sergeant Noble, who happens to be Lee Noble, because uh, I bring both of those people to work with me every day. So other than that, now you know who I am. Y'all can buy me lunch just like the gentleman back there did when you see me. <laughs> okay. We do a lot of training here. We take pride in our training. We take pride in making people better, so we give them all the tools they need to, to have to be better. What they do with those tools, we hope and pray to do the right thing, but I promise you that all of our officers expect better out of our coworkers. Oh, what is that? User error, or is that your? your <laughs> okay, here we go. Is this it right here? Okay. Well, looks like, uh, okay, the newest, version of this I didn't get. Well, I didn't look at it. You sent it. Okay. okay, let me come out here a little bit. Okay, okay we, we do several things here. We really care about how people interact with the police, but uh, more importantly, we, we worry about how we interact with people. Um, we all understand that we're all human and everybody's a little bit apprehensive, so we all wanna work together to try to meet, you know, for, the, for uh, to do the right thing in the middle. Uh, they got the Community Safety Education Act that was signed into law in 2017. It requires all students to enter the eighth grade to participate in a class and watch video instructions on how to properly interact with the police officers during traffic stops. It requires all officers to attend some of the training and uh, Senator Royce West was a champion of, those, of this program. Um, have anybody seen that video yet? Okay. Ma'am? I think it's on the internet, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to the T Code website, you should be able to pull it up. Yes, ma'am. Um, you may see if you go on the internet, you know, you type one thing in, it'll give you 50 different things. Half of them won't even be related to what we're talking about. We don't want you to pull up the one where you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. We, we're not going to give them any advertisement here. But um, there are certain things you have to do, okay? Um, I'll, I'll, real quick, before we go any further, I can tell you this. Every time I do instructing and stuff, it's more of a conversation. It's not a lecture. So if y'all want to stop me, want me to detail something or provide information, I'm, I really enjoy that. Okay, so some of the training that we do, we do cultural diversity training, crisis intervention, de-escalation, civilian interact, interaction training, human trafficking, canine encounters, and as you can see, we worry about how we interact with the deaf and hard of hearing, and we do legal update. The cultural diversity is uh, in the crisis intervention, de-escalation, those things are really, really big right now because we're trying to build relationships. And uh, this right here is something we have to do uh, is, it, is, it by, is it every two years now? We have to, it's this continual. We're not, I can tell you right now, we're not perfect, but guess what? We're gonna keep working to be perfect, and every year we get, get training, we're gonna get trained, and we're gonna document that until we get where we're trying to go. This is gonna always be happening. Also, civilian interaction training, that goes with your you know, uh, consensual contacts. You know, when you come across people in the street, it may not involve a police action, it might just be a police talking to a citizen. Uh, human trafficking, uh, you know, of course, you know, unfortunately, we have to admit it, we do have human trafficking in our city along the, the, seven, the 35 corridor 
we work on those types of things. And we also keep up with the updates with the legislature and all the new rules. So we can make sure we're applying the, the correct laws in the right way. Uh, in order to document these things and do the right thing and hold ourselves accountable, we, we do have the body-worn cameras. Uh, we actually got an updated camera that they're distributing now, so we're standing up with the technology. We're not going to fall behind in that. Uh, we have court security officers. Uh, you see eyewitness identification training, police chief's training. He's always gone somewhere learning something. And I, I thought you knew everything. <laughs> I, th I did. I thought he did. I found out recently he don't know nothing. He don't know much. <laughs> okay, we got the school resource office now. Can we ask questions you said a dialogue? Can we oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, on one of your, I'm sorry. On your, your two slides back, yes, you, you, you have uh, the Community Safety Education Act for ninth grade. Is that something that is made available to our young children as they are taking the test to get their driver's license? Because I don't know if my son has ever had that. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter going into ninth grade, and I had no knowledge of that. Right. So is this something that is required here when our young people are applying for their driver's license to see this video before they um, are able to get their driver's license? Because I think that's very important. That's a good question right there. Yeah, so, so it is mandatory training. For, uh, and it requires any student entering the ninth grade to participate in a class, watch video instruction on how to properly interact with the police officers. So it is mandatory training that. Where do they get that? Is that in their school? It, it's probably in driver's ed. They don't, they don't get driver's ed until like 15 or 16. And I'm just asking because I think that I would have, I think that's, inval that's valuable. That's so important. And yeah, I think and it should be, be required for whomever is driver's ed schools or the school district or when they have to come down to Miss Bobby's building. I call it her building because she was there when it first opened. Yeah, it's, so it's that, required. You know, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. So that when, before they take that picture and get that driver's license, it, they have to do that because I think that is a very powerful resource. I had no idea we had it. So that's why I wrote that down in my notes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, and if you all will Google Tico how to interact with the police, that video will be there and that is the exact video that's required. And that's the one that's required for our training as well. I just had a follow up from Dr. Petaway. I teach ninth and 10th grade at LHS Harmon and I'm in charge of the African American Association for the students and we, we actually had two police officers come and talk to us about how to interact with police. I invited them. I asked our SRO at the time um, to see who he could get to come in. I don't, I don't remember what the officers' names were, but I'm absolutely sure I've never heard of anything that the students had to watch before entering ninth grade. Not one of my students has ever mentioned that, and I've been teaching in this area for five years. So. Where, where is it required? Like, are they watching it at middle school level? Or where, like, where does that requirement? Where, yeah, what let, let, let us do some checking on that, and we will definitely get back with you and let you know. I, I assumed uh, it was through the school district, but I don't know. Uh, my question is similar to hers. I, I was watching the TV, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, and Dallas and Fort Worth, we're publicizing it on Channel 5. Uh, and actually in Fort Worth, I think uh, someone on the city council was working with the police department. This was a webinar and they were advertising it. It was like July, sign up dates was the end of July through August. So my point is that they're publicizing it, they're making it known. And especially with you know the things that are going on now and even some of the testimonies that people gave at our first meeting about their experiences with the police. I think this is a proactive way of working with the community, showing that we're concerned, doing something before something happens. Um, so if it is available, I think you know it is something that's great and we need to publicize, we need to make it known um, that it is available. And if I was a parent, uh, like someone said, you know, if 
I had someone in the ninth grade, I don't now, but anyway, um, I'd want to know, you know, did they pass, you know, did they go attend the seminar? And it may be something that even the parents may need to be involved too, because uh, a lot of this teaching comes from home. And as some of uh, the parents have said here, you know, they've had the conversation, uh, you know, with their son or daughter. So I, I believe it is something that if you have, it is valuable and we need to do what we can to, to get it out there. Absolutely. I was and, just... and what we will do, uh, I think we can make it happen. We'll put that uh, video up on our transparency page so that everyone has access to it. And it's not the best video in the world. The acting is horrible. I was going to show it to that, but it's too long, and the, it's, it's, the acting's horrible. So take it for what it's worth, but the message is, is there. Yes, ma'am. I was going to agree with uh, Ms. Bugs and say, you know, the law was passed in 2017. It take, there's probably the reason why we haven't heard of it. It takes a while to, de once a law is passed, it takes a while for something to develop to actually get to where it can be implemented. And he didn't tell us the implementation date. But I think this is something we ought to check with the school district as well. Because my thought is if every ninth grader is supposed to have it, the school district has access to every ninth grader. And we can certainly uh, contact the, the uh, charter schools as well. And they actually should be the focal point. And I'm assuming that's what the law was intended that they would do it. That's why they picked ninth grade. Uh, to do it, and we just got to make sure that the school district is actually uh, has something in place, and it is a part of their curriculum. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Dr. Petaway apologized. You don't have to do that. No, that's what I'm saying. We we need that feedback. If we can't get that feedback, we can't put anything on that paper up there. That right now. Okay. All right. I'm going to move forward. Now, I can tell you this, too. I am from Texas, but I spent a lot of years in Alaska and overseas in, the, in uh, Guam and Japan. I, sometimes I start talking fast, slow me down, do like she did, and stop me, because I will keep going. There we go. Any questions here? This stuff is very important, I think, right here. These first three or four right here. The other ones, is, you know, human trafficking is really important. And I did a lot of work in that because I was a child crimes detective for years. And uh, definitely, we got our finger on the pulse on that, OK? So mm -hmm. with de-escalation, <laughs> yes, um, that's a hot topic right now yes, with the things that's happening in our society. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, with your training, I see it's mandated. Is it a one-time occurrence? Is it a continuing annually that you have to do this? You know, yes, are there some type of disciplinary action if you don't? And how effective do you think the de-escalation is? I know we don't have some of the problems that other cities may have, but we still have young people here the same. Right. And, you know, my, my son just sent me a text message saying that he and our neighbor across the street were getting ready to go driving together before they leave to go to college in their different directions. And I responded, no, you're not. Because I still just don't want him. You know, he does, my son hasn't, thank, praise God, hasn't gotten in any trouble. But I know trouble's out there. And mm -hmm. I just told him, no, you're not going anywhere. Right. So my, my question is, what... How do you all define de-escalation? Because it can be defined differently. Yes. And I knew that was going to be probably the hot topic of the day. And I think all that's the next coming few up. slides. It's, yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. But, no, one thing about it is that you, you defining how important it is to you and you talking about your son is okay for us to stop and talk right here because I'm going to get to it. I'm going to make sure I get you everything you need to hopefully help you feel more comfortable and give you some, some input on how we're doing things. Sorry. I'm sorry, ma'am. But it's about the same thing, though. It's, a, it's about de-escalation. So as a teacher, you know, we are taught to de-escalate situations all the time because we don't want to be on, the, on YouTube fighting with our students. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder why 
it seems that at least the, the bad stories you see on TV, cops are not de-escalating. They seem to be the aggressors to escalate the situation. I'm hoping that's not the case here, but what, what is the training? Is there martial arts like training that where you learn how to subdue somebody without having to pull out your gun or your taser? I mean, what actually goes into the process of de-escalation? Or is it psychological, like you're talking somebody down from a situation? What is it? Okay. Well, I'll make sure I tell you that because I think that's important too. And can you guys hear me okay back there? Okay. Uh, just yeah. one, more, one more statement. Yes, ma'am. So if you, did read, if you did see some of the previous videos, the first night, the last speaker was an 18-year-old boy or an 18-year-old young man. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he mentioned was his fear that he didn't want to drive. Is this the one named Caleb? Yes. Okay. And so I'm hoping that when you're talking about this, you're keeping that young man in, in mind. Well, I can tell you this from Lee Noble, that's why I'm dressed like this, is that I keep all of our kids in mind. And just to expound on why I do, and this is not just about me, but the guys I work with. I did eight and a half years as a child crimes detective. I worked child murders, physical abuse, kidnapping, human sex trafficking, child pornography. I did that for eight and a half years and saw the worst of the worst. And coming from my background, you know, I'm traumatized growing up as it is. I carry that weight on me every day. Every time I see this scar on my face, this comes from a clothes hanger. I got scars you definitely won't be able to see. But this scar to me is healed. If you don't look at it real good, you won't know. It looks like a gaping wound in my face to me. You know what trauma do, does to people? Because it, it feels like it's exposed. And I've learned to talk about it. That's why I care about kids. And that's why that kid, that's, that's why I know his name. Because that, that really stood out to me. And he was very articulate, too. So I promise you, all of this, we keep all of this in mind. Are we always successful? Is it always perfect? Nothing's ever going to be, uh, going to be perfect. But the, I think the goal here is to strive towards perfection. And you know, like I know in the church they'll tell you, you'll never be perfect. But you need to work as hard as you can to be perfect. You always got to set that goal higher so that if you don't meet that goal, you get close and you can continue to try to reach that goal. And I promise you we'll do that. And these are some of the things we do here to protect us all. The body-worn cameras, I'm sure, and, and like you were saying about the videos and everything, um, keeping things in perspective, I know I'm, I'm probably about 300, 400 years older than most of y'all in here. And uh, you didn't see a lot of these things because everything was on the newspaper. You saw it two or three days later. You saw it in a, in a book, a magazine. All this stuff right now is it's immediate uh, distribution. And we know that you can get... And I'm not, there's no excuse for any of it, i tell you that right now. But you can compile 10, 15 different videos of some, something really bad that happened and miss two to three million incidents where something great has happened. You know? And this and is just a fact. I, you know, the media does what it does. But we can't sit around and really, as officers, stomp our feet and be mad about that bad thing that they did because they showed it. Because it makes us angry because it makes us all look bad, right? It really does. But the good things we do, I tell my guys all the time, you be a good officer because you came here to do the right thing. You don't have to do anything more to try to make yourself look good because if you're doing that, maybe you're not good enough. You know what I'm saying? So all we can do is just keep chopping away at trying to expose us, who we really are. And then we're gonna continue to do that. And with the supervision in place right now, with the chief we have, the city manager we have right now, with people like her, and she trained me, so if anything goes wrong, my, trip, my records, her stuff is all over my records. If I go to court, she goes with me. So y'all can sue me, because I ain't got no money. Um, we do all these other things, rescue task force, that's for like active shooter situation. You know, we've had that in South Texas, down there in El Paso. Uh, I can tell you right now, uh, just a little bit about that. We don't wait. There's none of that waiting. Active shooter situation, we're going to put ourselves between the bad guy and the good guy, and with bullets flying, we are going in. If that person does not go in, like that guy did in Florida, he's not going to be here anymore. I can tell you that. They're not going to play that. So I'm letting you know, we put ourselves on the line, and we're planning on doing that if we have to here. We hope we don't have to, but we're going to. 
And, and that's something where law enforcement tr uh, changed. After Columbine, if you remember, if you look back at the, the news video of that, the, what the officers did, they set up a perimeter and they waited on the SWAT team. And then the paramedics, they waited on everything to be clear before they went in. We have cha totally changed our training. Uh, officers, the first officers on the scene, they are trained to go in and take the threat out. As soon as we get one area secure, our paramedics come in. Even while someone may be in the back of the, back of the school shooting. So that's one thing that's unique that we do here is the rescue task force training with the fire department and we all work together to try to save the kids' lives. Um, response to resistance, we do a lot of training about, you know, you know, as far as responding to physical resistance to us, we do train on that type of thing. I'm not one of the SWAT team members, you know, uh, I'm, I'm probably a little bit physical and uh, a little bit crazier than them, but I'm not one of them. I, I, I am, I just, me and my kids wrestle and fight all the time, so I think I'm tough, so. Uh, we do taser recertification. Uh, we do our you know, emergency police driving, first aid and CPR. Uh, of course, we learn how to use our weapons and be proficient in our weapons training. Now, on the non-biased policing and de-escalation, uh, we started really building on this probably about five years ago, four years ago? Yeah, we started it one year prior to it being mandated by the state. We sent all of our officers through that training and then the, uh, the state mandated it, and we had to send everyone through again, which was good, but it was based off of our lesson plan, and they wouldn't give us credit for it because, because it was before it was enacted. But what you're seeing on, on the next few slides are actual slides from that course. And me and Lee, we, we were one of the first to, to start the class, me, him, and, and Martin Poppy, and we all taught that class together and, some of you came, I know Pastor uh, Cox, you came and, and talked to the group. So what we did during that training was we asked people from the community to come in and talk to the police about what they had experienced, kind of like what you all are doing with us. We did that with the officers. It was great interaction, asking questions. If, it, if we don't run out of time, I'll use the, the example that, that Pastor Cox did in the class, which was kind of neat. We also just, know, just let you know that we, we looked at all cultural diversity here in the city. We had the, a Hindu representative there. We had a, a Chin representative as well. Uh, of course, Pastor Cox came. And so we just wanted everybody to, you know, actually us listen to what they thought and what they felt and then tell us what we can do better to, to open up some type of dialogue with their community, you know, because we, we don't know the language. You know, they usually have uh, mediators or or representatives in this country. And some of them come here as, uh, as uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, what you call those guys? Yeah, come here as refugees. So, you know, we're just working on that. We're working, doing our best we can to build on that. But as we see here, uh, we all know what this is. We all know when this happened, the era in the 50s, uh, back when they had the Jim Crow laws. Uh, of course, everybody knows Jim Crow laws, and I'm sure, ma'am, you're probably a little bit younger than me. But uh, in the Jim Crow laws, I'm not going to. Oh, you're young. You're young. You can still join the police department. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they made these uh, informal laws to keep black people confined to a, a mental capacity of slavery by separation and segregation. And what they did was, you know, that's where, and you know about it, but sometimes you got to frame it. That's where the, the rear entries into the restaurants, uh, separate bathrooms, separate. Uh, park benches, sitting on the back of the bus, uh, uh, all, this, all the voting rights, all of that, all the part of the Jim Crow thing, okay? So it was ruled unconstitutional, and then they had law enforcement out here enforcing those laws. That is not our job. That's not why we're here. And we are so far beyond that, I don't even know why we're where, where we are right now. We are the, we're the messenger, you know what I'm saying? We're in the middle. You've got legislators, and you've got the civilians, who, the people who's trying to get things done, right? And then we're in the middle. And that right there, they, I think they did this stuff because they wanted to. That's not us anymore, okay? But yet, like I said, we, we, we vote those people in, they create laws, 
They pass the laws to us, we enforce the laws. We just gotta know how to enforce them fairly, impartially, and, and do it the right way. And before he leads, leaves that slide, one thing we don't shy away from is the history. The, the first, what, two hours mm -hmm. is the history that police had with the black community. And it's an uncomfortable discussion, but it's the truth. So we talk about that at length, and that's where this slide from is talking about how police were used illegally against the black community. Yep. And um, that course, uh, Pastor Cox, I'm not sure if you actually sat in the entire course or the first half of it. It's a, it's a really tough conversation. It's uncomfortable. But I feel like this. If we're tasked with taking care of our community and they give us all these authorities to enforce those laws and they give us these weapons and they trust our judgment, we need to have those hard conversations. It's not, we, we shouldn't candy coat nothing. We shouldn't be ashamed to talk about anything because if we can't talk about it in-house, how are we gonna do the right thing out of our house? That course is probably one of the most strictest course, hardest conversations we ever have. And we make sure we do it every two years. So let's talk about biases. We all have implicit biases. A lot of people don't, uh, don't you know, understand that we have them. And like me, uh, if I see somebody wearing a Philadelphia Eagle shirt, I got a problem with it. <laughs> I got a big problem with him. So when I see that, I feel that if he was on fire, I wouldn't pour water on him. I mean, that's, and, and, you know, and that's against my better nature, because I know I would want to save his life. But I would stop and think for a minute. <laughs> I, was, I will stop and think and be like, well, I don't know. I can go ahead and put a dash of water on it. But we all have them, you know. I'm sure at this point, the, the biggest uh, example of implicit bias, bias right now at this time is that if you guys see a police officer standing on the side of the road talking to a young black man, first thing that'll come to your mind is what's going on. I heard this in the news, I've seen this before, and I imagine. 75% of you are gonna park and pull your phones out and record. You know, that's just the real world. That conversation is real. That's what we all, that's all we do here. We're not gonna play around. And I get it, I get it. But then guess what? They separate, they, the, the officer shake the black kid's hand. Now you're thinking, well maybe he wasn't doing something. Maybe he was just talking to the kid, trying to, the kid may have asked him a question. But that's understandable, there's not, nothing wrong with it. But it is a way to get past that implicit bias Nobody says we can ever change it, but we can get, get past it. So we need to understand how these things turn into stereotypes. Okay, implicit bias can be the opposite of everything you believe, but you know, we shouldn't feel guilty about that. So we go into stereotyping here. We label people by characteristics. Let's say you got a guy on the corner with his pants sagging with a hoodie on. I mean, you're not gonna say he's committing a crime, but the first thing you're gonna say he's a thug. Just be real, right? Or you see a guy with a whole bunch of tattoos in Walmart, and he got all these tattoos, and his head is shaved. First thing you're gonna think is he's a racist and white supremacist. You know what I'm saying? Or you see a cop. First thing you're gonna think, is, oh, he's probably one of those bad cops. You know? Matter of fact, I ain't gonna lie, I see him too when I'm off work. And I'll be like, okay, I know your job, don't come over here. But yeah, so we just got to understand these stereotypes. We need, if we control our biases and get over the stereotypes, we'd be better, better understand how we get to know people. And there's a certain way to do that. We have to individuate. If anybody seen this term out there, it's a term you know that we always do, but they have to put a new word on it so somebody who wrote this can have a job. <laughs> just like laws, is you have to treat people based on that individual themselves. Martin Luther King said it, right? Not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. This is all this really is, just an offshoot of that. You individuate, you make an effort to put, put in place uh, yourself in a situation to leave a positive interaction with a member of the other group. Develop and understand humility and weakness is, is not a weakness. Individual judgment. And I tell you, once you put yourself in those situations where you can talk to people and get to know people, it, it makes you a little bit closer, right? I can tell you right now, when I listen to you guys on my, in the first two or three videos, 
I kind of felt like I, I know you a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Some of you guys were really honest about having more words than necessary. And I was like, okay, I get that. And, you know, and the pastor has to close it out at the end of the day. And the principal has to try to close it out, and you got him. So I can tell you right now, one of the biggest things in, as far as me being a representative of the Louisville Police Department is the humility. I write all the time. I write, and I write, and I write, and I lay myself out on paper. And, and I let my kids read it, and I make them write. It's this. Your emotions and, and your, your, human, hum, your humanity is not a weakness. It's a strength. When you, can, when you can kind of own that, it makes you a better person. Because you don't have to hide. Because that's what we bring to the job every day. We're emotional people, and we need to treat people like humans. And, it, and don't see it as a weakness. We're not all tough and everything. We got problems in families and goals and dreams, you know? So what we try to do to treat people correctly as, far, as a matter of a process here is called the, uh, the critical decision-making process, a, a model. This is something we do all the time. You guys do it too. Okay, so let's say you get a call out. It's five stages to the critical decision-making model. You collect an information. So to put yourselves in our shoes, Dispatch gives us a call. They says there's a disturbance at the apartment complex. Okay, first thing she taught me is to what if. That's what we call it. Okay, well, dispatch, can you tell me do we have any priors at that address? Dispatch, do we have any, have any prior contact with anybody at that address? Dispatch, do they know if there's uh, anybody that's been, uh, is, is there alcohol involved? Dispatch, do they know if they have a history of weapons? We assessing everything. This happens every time we get on the radio. So when you see an officer on the radio like this, when you pass by him, a lot's going on in his head. So he's collecting information, and then he's assessing what's going to happen when he gets there. As soon as he gets out of the car, he needs to be in stage two. In stage step two right here, he's assessing threats. He's assessing the threats and the risks. So what happened? You assess the threat. Some people don't understand this, and I get it. You actually are at risk when you get there in the car. You at risk when you step your foot out because you don't know if traffic's going to come this direction. You don't know if the guy in the car is going to step out and shoot you. You don't know. So you're not, you're not scared, but you're just planning. You assess, when you see those threats, you decide, you make quick decisions. When I get out, I need to get to the opposite side of the car where I might be able to have some cover. Or I might need to get out and go to the back of the car because we heard that the person had a gun in the car. You're doing all of this stuff, and at the same time, you're still collecting information from dispatch. Dispatch, give me an update. Dispatch, I think I might need a backup unit. And while you're assessing the threat, now you gotta consider what is my authority to be here? Do I have the legal authority to be here? Do I have the statutory authority to be here? You know, um, what is our agency policies? What's our procedures? You know, am I gonna have to use some of my training from de-escalation? Okay, so you're still doing that. At the same time, you're still assessing threats and collecting information. And then you're going to move on into identifying your options and what your choices are going to be. You're going to decide what you're going to do. Now, when you get there and you're going to decide what you're going to do, you're not done right there. You have a, that's not set in stone because you gather, you gather more information. You're reassessing that threat. You, everything's adjusting to change within your statutory authority. And then you're going to reassess what you're going to do. So you can change. All of this can change, and you're still going to be collecting information. It's, it's, a, it's a process. You know when we all do this? We all do this when we decide what bills we're going to pay. Am I going to pay the light bill on time? Am I going to buy those new shoes? I need to pay the insurance on my son's car because he ain't going to pay it because he's lazy. You know what I'm saying? You're assessing all the time. I mean, anyway, that's my own turn. But while we're doing that, the center of this entire model is that we have to be within our ethics, the, uh, the core values that the chief had just spoken about. We have to be within that. We have to have values. And you know what? Our department talks about values. You know, value people you know, from the core values, value people. But guess what? We all have personal values, personal values. We're all good people, right? I don't think all of you get up today trying to figure out how you're gonna kill somebody. Y'all know better than that. We all have our own personal values. Then we gotta use pro proportionate amount of enforcement, not over for enforcement, not put somebody in jail just because we can. It's about the spirit of the law, at, well, I'd say most of the time, not just the letter of the law, depending on how bad the crime is. So we gotta be proportionate, and we have to have sanctity of life. Life comes first. And I know I'm talking, anybody got any questions? Good? Okay. So let's talk about the 
Okay, the, the things that, the benefits of de-escalation is the fact that it does increase officer safety because if I can de-escalate, it's mostly verbal. I would say the majority of what we teach in de-escalation is verbal. Um, in order to be verbal, you gotta have some type of communication skills, right? But I can tell you this and be honest with you, the younger generation coming into law enforcement, even into other jobs, they don't have the communication skills that we've had because the internet told them everything they're supposed to think. They text each other. I did an experiment one time. I put two kids in two different rooms that I needed to talk to. And I, I introduced them to each other and I sat them next to each other, they didn't say a word. What left the room, they exchanged information, went back, separated them, they was texting each other. They couldn't talk. So you, we have to have the ability to communicate with people. And then that decreases the liability. The liability of us actually, actually being pushed or accidentally doing something excessive that's gonna cause injury, harm, or death. And that would bring the city into it, and this is something they don't need to be dealing with if we do our jobs correctly. We decrease complaints, and they, we didn't say we didn't get any complaints now. I can stop somebody on the side of the road, and they, I might get a complaint even if I don't write him a ticket. They're gonna say, I don't know why he stopped me, but he didn't write you a ticket. I don't care. You may still get a complaint, and then you improve, improve our professionalism, and then reduce verbal conflicts, and, and can reduce personal stress. It's personally stressful for us, it really is. We'll go from one big verbal conflict to helping somebody uh, who may have a deceased parent. Then go to the next place where it might have a child that was sexually assaulted. And then go to another place and sit down and eat, eat lunch. Like when you saw me pastor, like nothing has ever happened. So before we leave that, I'm gonna tell you about the de-escalation. It is verbal. Um, we're supposed to talk a person down, an agitated person down, so that we can avoid getting into physical conflict. I tell my guys all the time, and we talk about all different cultures in de-escalation. We talk about Hispanics, black, Chin, Hindu, Muslim, and we talk about all the different uh, characteristics and cultures with up under each one of them. And then I've studied a lot on all of them. And I tell these guys, and we got all these points that, like black people, me, we're emotional people. We talk with our hands. If we feel like we, there's an injustice, we want to be heard, okay? I tell these guys, everybody has the right to vent. You don't have to tase somebody just because they're talking, because they're expressing themselves. Give that person an opportunity to say what he's going to say. If he's not trying to run from you, he's not trying to hurt you, and you can keep a little bit of a reactionary gap back so everything's safe, he has the right to talk. That's part of de-escalation. And while he's talking, you let him get it out, and then you start a conversation. I used to take my, I was a field training officer. I followed behind her, who's my field training officer. I learned a lot from her. I've been in places where people were brawling, and I have a trainee with me, and he's scared to death. And I tell him, walk in, assess, see where the conflict is. You don't go in there trying to say, yell louder to them. When you yell louder to somebody else, who you think's listening? Who's listening? Nobody. And, and then I, I told him, walk closer, and you say, can I help y'all? Is it anything? He said, with that type of voice? I said, yeah. And I showed him, and everybody brought their voices down to hear me, even though they were still angry. All kinds of different techniques you can use. Now, sometimes, I, I can be honest with you, there are times where you can't de-escalate because things are so far gone that you have to jump in at a higher level of, of force. You know, unfortunately that happens. You, if somebody has a knife and they threaten to kill somebody and they're chasing somebody, you just can't be like, please put the knife down. Those are the situations we don't want to be in. But I, gotta, I think, you know, I, I worry about that person with the knife. I don't worry about their life as well. You know, I, we, I warn them, hey, put the knife down. Now, if they hold the knife and they're not chasing the person anymore, I don't need to shoot them. You know what I'm saying? The knife only does what the person does, right? Okay, so that's, a, that's part of a de-escalation, that talking them down. We have negotiators. And, she, and, and uh, Sergeant Italian's a negotiator. We get them to help us out. So we have a lot of things as far as de-escalation. It's all mostly verbal. And then, of course, we have to go hands-on. We do get trained on that. I don't, I don't have one of the SWAT guys here to explain that, but we do. We don't go in a, we don't learn to kill people. <laughs> we learn how to handcuff people. We learn how to do, like, like, uh, arm bars, we learn how to do takedowns, uh, karma pr 
peroneal strikes. Like, you know, you got a nerve right here. You hit them there. It'll take them off balance. We, uh, we cross their feet so that if they're going to try to get up and run, they have to do one or two extra moves in order to do it. And that way to give us heads up so we can just get on them. You know, because we know if things go past that, you never know what's going to happen. And that's the last thing we want to do because we never get up in the morning planning on doing that. We never wake up planning on hurting anybody. Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. No problem. I'm patient. <laughs> so when you get the call, mm -hmm. they tell you that it's an African-American man that's making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. Do you guys behave differently? I mean, as far as how you how you're prepared or how you come to this to the case, as far as your assessment, because that really starts at the time you get the call, right? It does. Okay. It, the information you're going to get is, you know, first they're going to say, you know, you know, whatever unit you are, 303 copy of disturbance, and you're telling them you come with the information. They're going to say, uh, we have a disturbance at um, 1096, you know, Charles Street or whatever, and they'll be like, okay. And it'd be like, um, then they'll give you details as you're going. Okay, what they're giving you is a description. Say, so there's going to be a black male out in the lobby or out in the, the park area with a knife or out there yelling and causing and chasing people around, but he doesn't have a weapon. They don't know his name, you know? And yet, when we go there, the same thing a black person can do, a white person can do, a Hispanic person can do, I can tell you from the, everybody I know, they're not thinking it's a black guy is going to be different. That guy is going to be just as dangerous as the white guy. The white guy's going to be dangerous as the Hispanic guy. I'm just saying that's how that's how we're thinking. You know, the, his race had really has no factor in what I'm thinking at that time. And I know that's where the implicit biases come out. I, I I'm just telling you from my experience and the guys I work with. I I I have nothing to hide, and I can just tell you that's exactly the way it works. Okay. Well, I guess the reason I'm kind of giving you that side look because that incident in New York. Mm -hmm. That woman knew as soon as she said African-American man, mm -hmm. she knew that those police were going to come there mm -hmm. prepared mm -hmm. with a different mindset. And so that's when, why I'm asking what's going on is here. Is this in the park? Yeah, <coughs> when um, the guy was um, bird watching yeah. and the woman, mm -hmm. now, you know, I, now I can tell you this. There has been times where people would do that. Like if we get a true call, it's a true call, you know, a true incident. But if you have someone that's calling just to harass somebody, we don't know that until we get there. And, they don't, and the word black doesn't mean anything, because I, you know, I really don't hear that. I just know I got to look for a black guy in this area. Um, people that do that, um, it's, I, don't, I don't have a word for them, huh? Yes, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. And, and, and dispatch only knows what they're telling, what she's telling them. And the officer just goes there, and he's just, He's locked in on the description and what supposedly happened. In my opinion, I would charge the person that called if I can prove that they did that. Abuse of 911, false report. I really would. But that's in New York. That's not, we don't do that here. Okay, well, I'm saying, so do you do that? Do, if, if Karen is, has made this thing and said that this African-American man or Hispanic man is doing mm -hmm. this, and you get there and it's a false report, mm -hmm. does Karen get a ticket? Well... If she was doing that, because I haven't experienced that yet here, but I know what I would do, because all that, remember I told you one about the communication and the circle? I do that every day of my life. I put that, I put my mind through that type of situation. If that happened to me, yeah, she's getting, she's not getting the ticket, she's getting arrested. Because that's not a class C misdemeanor. Well, it's a class B now, right? False report? Yes, it's a class B. You can't write a ticket for that. Okay, yes, ma'am. And I would think my chief would be upset if I didn't. I mean, am I wrong? <laughs> I mean, or you know what I would do? Because I'm an officer and I have the authority to do it. I got a good chief. But if he wasn't a good chief, guess what I'd do? I'd do it anyway, and then I'll let him know why I did it, and then we'll handle it after that. My job is to do the right thing. And that is a crime. But it does have to be investigated at times. You take it as a report for false report. You got the, you got the recording from dispatch. You got, you know, you got the guy's uh, video. You can use that all as evidence, and you can arrest her. I think she's going to say something. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering if there is a different way that dispatch can describe people, because when you use race as a factor, mm -hmm. we all have implicit biases, 
And, you know, whether you say he's six foot two, 250 pounds, in a gray shirt and blue jeans, but when you say he's a Hispanic male, he's a black male, he's a chin male, sometimes people get a little bit nervous. And so the officer, you know, it's, it's natural. So my whole issue is why race is used. And when I first moved to this area, I was amazed that the news would, when I first came, I thought all the crime must be committed by black people because the news would always talk about the black suspect. They never talked about, and now they start talking about Hispanics, but that's always the lead story. And so to me, maybe they tell you the race at the end of the communication when they're telling you what the situation is. Because you're mine, you're assessing, but you're assessing in a human body as well. And so I just wonder when they always, when you have to describe the race, and you may need to, but I think you could probably also use uh, some physical characteristics, ball, uh, you know, yes, lots you know, of hair, braids. They I do. Mean, whatever, but mm -hmm. I really think you ought to be careful when you use race because mm -hmm. that's a trigger point for a lot of different people, whether they know it or not, and how they approach that person may be different. They say, oh, no, it's not different, it's the same, but I bet if you looked at all the videos, you may see some difference, and I don't know if you look at the video cameras and see in your training and say, okay, in this situation, you approach this guy this way. It's just like a white dude with a whole bunch of tattoos. Mm -hmm. He gets approached uh, in a different way than a white guy in a suit, mm -hmm. though both of them could be extremely dangerous or not, mm -hmm. but it's how we internalize. So part of that description, when you start assessing where do you, you know, how do you separate that? Well, a lot of it is, is in our training. Lee, I'd like to jump in. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say this. As far as the, the descriptors that go out on the original dispatch, like what you were talking about, um, on a Sunday afternoon when people are out doing their yards, doing uh, things in the yard, uh, street, uh, washing their cars, uh, watering the flowers, whatever, it is very uh, significant to us when they say there is a Hispanic male, no further description, then when I pull onto y'all's street, I'm not looking for her, I'm not looking for him, I'm not looking for him, I am looking for a Hispanic male. Oftentimes our callers are unable to give detailed descriptions. In a perfect world, they'd say he's six foot two, about 280, big tattoo across his left arm, big tattoo on his right hand, you know, they would give lots, many times, it's a very vague description and or if it's dark outside, they can only discern it's a male or only discern he's white, you know, he's 20, 20 yards away. I could only tell he had darker skin. Well, that could be a Hispanic male, that could be a black male, the Indian male, uh, uh, lots of things. So for the initial dispatch call, it is relevant to me because when I pull onto the street, I, I really need to know, am I looking for a black male, white male, or a Hispanic male? So it, it's, it's relevant to, to me and my job. Real quick, don't leave. No. Oh. We are transitioning into her who, who covers all of this. She knows all, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as far as that. Do y'all have any other questions of me? Yes. Uh, I don't have a problem with how that. Do, I sit down. How do we get rid of the stereotypes as citizens? Because most of us think that when you say black male, as Joan said, uh, first thing coming to your mind that I've got to be a little tougher it's a black male or Hispanic male than I ha have to be if it's a white male. What do you suggest for us citizens so we won't always think that we're being stereotyped when you say black male or Hispanic male? I'm, uh, I think that's something that we can work on. Uh, as Joan said, maybe we can have a, another description, but how do you satisfy our mind that you're not discriminated that you're not that you not have already made up your mind before you get out there because you've said there's a black male is there anything that we can do well i'm you know well, you can do it. well as far as the the guy on the streets um the, i'm looking for the person who i'm being called on in order to to answer to the the complaint whoever made the call because i have to respond to, to do that part of my job um 
I don't know what more I can do. I know I know that I can individually control me, and I know me, and you guys don't. I get that. And uh, I don't know what else we can do. Now, suggestions from you guys on what a way of doing that. We would love to have suggestions on those types of things, and they can consider it. But, you know, at our level, I would never know exactly how to do that. I just know what to do, what I know is right. Uh, Before we turn it over to Courtney, just real quick, I will tell you that we still get calls of a black male walking down my street. Dispatch will ask them what they're doing. They're not doing anything. They're just walking down my street. We don't go. And if we do go, we don't contact that person. We drive through and keep going. Because unfortunately, there are people like that still around today. Well, I, I think when, when we say that there is no implicit bias when those calls come through for the officers, I think that's just like saying that we're all colorblind. And I think if we just sit down and, and just face the, the, the truth within us all as being humans and understand that we all do have an implicit bias towards everyone. As long as we keep saying we don't, the officers don't, America don't, we're always going to be here. Because I'm not going to lie. If I'm walking down the street and if I see a black person, I'm going to be at ease because I see my own. I'm not going to think that you're getting ready to cause harm to me. But if I see someone else that is not black, I'm going to be on my guard. Okay. So yes, I do have implicit bias. We all do, because we are human. And to say that we don't, we're lying to ourselves, and we're never, ever going to solve this problem, OK? So that's where it begins, when we do recognize that every single human being on this earth has implicit bias. And the job that the officers are in makes it more dangerous for everyone else because you have a weapon and you're coming forth with an implicit bias that you may have grown up in your house hearing derogatory words said about certain cultures. You may have been bullied by a certain culture when you were growing up. So to sit and say people don't, that's where the era is. And until we can acknowledge that it does exist, and once again, I'm going to keep saying this until Jesus comes back, it starts here. Well, earlier in our slideshow, we confirmed that everyone has implicit bias. That's just a fact. And as far as officers concerned, we have to go through this hiring process. We, nothing's going to be perfect. We've never ever said that nobody's going to be perfect. They're going to go through this, this strenuous hiring process to try to weed that out. The chief's going to have these uh, this core values, and he's going to evaluate it, and he's not going to want nobody in this department that's going to be that way. And then if somebody does slip through our training, we're going to make sure that they can be the idiot they want to be on their own time. But when they're here with Louisville, they're going to individuate. And then if they're not doing that, as supervisors, me and Sergeant Latalian, we review videos, and I'm going to hold them accountable. So Flat what out. about training where you're having to watch a video of an interaction with someone of a different race? Look at their pulse. Look at their, I mean, because when you are in are faced with an uncomfortable situation, your, your heart rate changes, your pulse changes. There's a lot of, I mean, you can bring people in that study body behavior. There's a way that we can combat this, okay? Because like I said, we all have, and as long as we keep saying that it doesn't exist or the officers, when they get that call, it's a black man and, and or Hispanic or African or Indian, I'm not gonna sit there and believe that all those things that you see on television that is portrayed about minorities. I'm not, I'm 50 years old, okay? You can pull stuff over my eyes sometimes, and I, but not all the time. I'm not gonna sit here and believe that when they go out to that call, that's how Tamir Rice was killed, okay? That that is not in the back of a police officer's mind. I can appreciate that. And I may be a bit, a bit, a little bit more militant. I'm sorry, no. but I mean that's just who I am. But you know, I, I just like the truth. Yeah, and but I think if we, but, like but I think Bible, and, I, truth and I, we all want the free. truth. We all want the truth. Trust me.
Well, I think we've obviously touched on a pretty uh, uh, energized subject here with the escalation. And I, I want to start my uh, comments with uh, I commend what I'm seeing tonight with this presentation. Um, I did not necessarily remember you um, from, from buying your lunch, but I'm glad I did. <laughs> and uh, Chief, thank you for remembering um, our contribution at, uh, during the training. Um, this presentation itself serves as a de-escalation for the folks that are in the room because it's helping us to understand more about what you're doing, what's going on behind the scenes. It's things that I didn't know, um, you know prior to coming in here. And I want to uh, dovetail from Ms. Bowie, who said, we're all humans. Every one of us in this room, human. Every one of us interacting outside, human. And we start down a negative path when we dehumanize each other, okay? If I don't see you as being a human being, it's a lot easier for me to treat you as less than a human being. And that's on both sides, okay? I, I, have, uh, I have a pet peeve of, of the word cops. It's negative in my mind. And I would prefer to refer to you as police officers. Um, when we did coffee with cops <laughs> at our church, um, it was hard for me making the announcement uh, and I, I even corrected even in the announcement that I didn't want any of our folks to refer to you as cops. To me, it's a negative term. And um, when, when we stop seeing each other as human beings, then it makes it easier for us to treat each other as less than. So I wanna commend what you're doing here with us but I also want to expand what you're doing in the community. I think that is critical. Uh, the things like uh, the, um, the academy um, or, the, I mean, the Citizens Academy and things like that. I think every one of the groups that go through there find out something new about you and, and it builds a level of respect. Uh, the things that you do as an SRO in the schools, that's, that's critically important to helping younger people have a potentially a better idea of who you are and why you should be respected. Uh, so my comment, I guess, is, is for us to uh, expand the things that you're already doing. Uh, you know, it's, it, it may be impossible for you to have this level of conversation with every one of our citizens, but the more that you can do it, the better our community is going to be able to respect both sides. All right. Thank you for that. If it's all right with you all, we're going to move forward and we'll come back to this at the end, if that's all right. Uh, and I just want to be clear that no one said we're not, we don't have biases. Everyone has biases. What our training attempts to do is teach people how to control their bias. If they do have that bias, my hope is that they will control it, and I never know about it. If they don't control it, and I do know about it, we deal with it. So now Courtney's going to come up, and she's going to talk to you about body-worn cameras. Good evening, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm humbled to be here. I thank the, the city staff for allowing me to come and speak. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I appreciate y'all having me. Um, you see, I have opted for the alternative dress this evening. Um, and I guess that's kind of because I am the uh, show and tell. I'm actually wearing the body-worn camera on the front of my uniform right now. It is turned off. Don't get uncomfortable. Lowe's in the front. It is turned off. But I just wanted for you all to be able to see, first of all, me in uniform. Because if you see me out on the streets, I need you to come say, hi, Courtney, how are you doing? I want you to recognize me. This is the way I look. Uh, this is the way I always look, and because I can't put my hair up or down, you'll always recognize me even when I'm not in uniform. So um, I appreciate the time to speak to you guys and uh, answer any questions for you. So 
I have to get my old lady readers on. Just a little bit about me. Um, I'm not nearly as exciting as Lee. Um, I've been here since I was 21. I started here with the city of Louisville. Um, part of my uh, raising is uh, Miss Bobby's fault. The other part is Melinda's fault. The other part is Miss Barron's fault. So uh, if, if you think I'm a soup sandwich, you have them to blame for it. I uh, came here in uh, August of 1991. Um, it was my calling. I believe that. Uh, this job is my passion. Um, it's not just what I do. It is not just a job to me. It is my way of life, period. Um, I have enjoyed all of my time here, met a lot of great people, and met some terrible people along the way. Um, the, uh, where's the clicker? Oh, you got the clicker. The uh, topic that I'm gonna speak to you about is about the body-worn cameras. Um, this program began in January of 2018. Um, every single officer, thank you, sir. Every single officer uh, from the captain level down is issued a body-worn camera. Um, it has to be on while we're in uniform unless we are doing an administrative role. This would be considered an administrative role, so I don't have to have it on. Uh, I just brought it for my show and tell. Um, disabling it in any way is uh, prohibited and the officers don't have any ability, not even supervisors, have the ability to delete any video or alter any video in any way. It's a magic upload process. I'm not very computer savvy, so I can't explain all the ins and outs of it, but it goes into a, a, you know, a magic cloud in the sky, and it is disseminated for evidentiary purposes. Um, the only people that have access to it, I believe, is our property evidence uh, technicians the, so that they can get the videos if anything should go to court. Um, we have this uh, really short general orders uh, inside the department that uh, governs our body-worn camera. This very short order is eight pages long. There is a lot of do's and don'ts, but very simply, um, the the requirement to wear it, um, my very first class that I went to on it, um, I, this was the part that I remembered most. When your feet hit the ground, turn on your camera. It's as simple as that. When your feet hit the ground, when you're going to a call, as soon as your feet hit the ground, you need to hit the record button. And that's the best and easiest way to remember. I wasn't sure about these when we got them. I wasn't sure if you can teach an old dog new tricks. It is yet another piece of something hanging on my body that I have to try to remember to turn on and to activate so that I'm in compliance with the general orders um, and the protection is there for whoever I'm talking to, the protection is there for me, uh, that the, the entire event will be, will be recorded. Um, we do forget on occasion to activate the camera if something happens very, very quickly if I have to jump out and react to either keep myself safe or keep the citizens safe, uh, we will forget to activate them. Our general orders uh, implicitly state that as soon as you realize, uh-oh, I, I forgot to hit the button, you're supposed to hit the button as, as quickly as you can. Um, you know, you've, you've seen the, uh, the news reports, the, the, the videos on YouTube of traffic stops that go badly, police officer pulls a, pulls a violator over, violator jumps out and starts shooting. That's gonna be one of those where the last thing I think of is activating my camera. Um, I have my in-car camera going, but it does not have audio. This one on, that we wear has audio and video, and it's actually very quality video. Um, the general order, which I will not stand here and read to you guys because y'all will all be curled up with a blanket and a pillow. The officers wearing covert apparel or a class A uniform, such as the fancy ones that we wear at funerals and things of that nature, um, our honor guard, they do not have to wear the body-worn camera when they are in those roles. You will not see officers having their body-worn cameras on during a funeral service or anything of the sort. Our SWAT operators, however, do have to have those on. When they go to serve any warrants or conduct an operation, they do have to have them on, and even with all their other gear, um, with this slide here. This is following along and it's excerpts out of this lengthy order um, talking about when the body-worn camera should be on or can be off. 
Um, obviously, as I previously stated, we, we like to hit the button uh, to start the recording uh, on, on the initial observation of any suspicious or criminal behavior uh, before exiting our vehicle, uh, whether we were dispatched or not. So if I just see uh, Miss Bobby out in her front yard wearing nothing but a wedding veil and a roller skate, um, I'm, I'm going to probably go ahead and hit that recorder before I get <laughs> Um, so any officer initiated, you know, maybe I'm just rolling through her neighborhood and I see her out there like that and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and hit that recorder before I ever engage with her. Um, during all arrests, any field contacts, traffic stops, pedestrian stops, um, vehicle pursuits, and foot pursuits. And again, the foot pursuit one is a tricky one. It's been my experience that um, if somebody takes off running, it happens so fast. It's all I can do, to, the old lady, to keep up. Um, I'm trying to make sure my weapons are secure. I'm trying to get going, and I'm wearing 25 extra pounds of gear. I, I may not always remember to hit it during the foot pursuit, but again, we do try to remember as soon as, as, soon as we're able to. Um, our cameras have to remain activated until the conclusion of the event, uh, unless specifically allowed in accordance with our policy. Now, our policy has a lengthy list it's the chief trying to get me hurt. Um, the exceptions are we do not have to have the camera activated during our entire shift. Um, it's only the things that I outlined uh, once we get out on a call for service of traffic stop and what have you. We don't just walk around the PD with them activated. We can have them powered on for the entire shift. There's just a quick press of the button that starts the recording process. Um, we are prohibited from intentionally creating any kind of recordings of employees in areas where uh, expectation of privacy exists. We have those accidental locker room recordings, restroom recordings. When those happen, especially our men folk, they forget to turn the thing off when they stop at a QT or stop at a racetrack uh, to take, take care of their business. They have to come to a supervisor and let me know. Uh, there might be a recording that needs to be deleted. Then we have to go through the chain to contact the property evidence people so that they can uh, cut that video because it's insensitive. Um, once we are done with a call at Miss Bobby's house, and she's fine, she's just wearing her wedding veil and roller skate for no reason, I'm gonna stop that recorder, and then you live across the street, so you say, oh, officer, can I talk to you for a minute? I am then going to reactivate it because it has to stop from her call and then start on yours. That way it keeps it separated, so any business that you and I discuss has nothing to do uh, with the on the same video as with Ms. Bobby. Um, we, yes, ma'am. So just you talking to me, uh -huh. so that means I'm probably on some video somewhere just having a blank conversation with, with us. Now, if I knew, if you and I were just friendly. Well, no, like if I just saw you and I'm like, well, how you doing today? So uh, I'm on your video. In that, in that, the way you're describing that, if you just saw me coming across from Bobby's house and you said, hey, how are you? I'd say, doing just fine. How are you? That'd be the end of it. I wouldn't even activate oh, it. Okay. But if you say, come here, can I talk to you for a second? I'm going to go ahead and activate it per, per the policy and I'll walk up and you'll say, well, you know, my, my lady, my next door neighbor's cat keeps getting in my garden and this, that, and the other. As soon as I realize this is not a police matter per se, I can turn it off because it's, it's irrelevant. Yeah. But just a how do you do or somebody buying somebody lunch, we, uh, we don't have to have it activated for that. Um, we are uh, also very mindful of recordings inside the hospital or when we have somebody who needs mental health treatment. Uh, we will turn the camera off because of the sensitive nature of some of the conversations and or uh, state of disrobing uh, people at, at the hospital. Um, if we do keep it activated at a hospital setting or in an ambulance setting, we will keep it activated, let's say, God forbid, they are badly, badly hurt and may die. I'm going to keep that camera going so that if there is a dying declaration that this person says, I'm gonna be able to capture that on, on video. Um, 
Let's see, got a couple more. We, uh, let's see. We do not record in court facilities, legal proceedings, governmental meetings, council meetings, or other secured government facility. And we also are strictly prohibited from uploading or uh, converting any of the, the data for any use on social media. Uh, I would think that goes without saying. These are strictly for evidence. We are not uh, able to get recordings and then blast them out on Facebook or YouTube or anything silly like that. Yes, ma'am. So how long do you, how long do you hold on to these tapes? I cannot answer that question. Chief, do you know off the top of your head? We follow the retention laws of the state. If, if there's evidentiary value, depending on what the crime is, we'll hold those longer. But if it's just a, a, a traffic stop, I believe that is two years. But it is automatically set up to delete the time frame. So. And then how often um, are they tested for quality? Uh, at the beginning of each shift, every officer has to start it up, make sure it's recording and doing its thing. If uh, an officer goes out on a call and they realize they've got some weird lights blinking, something's going on, they bring it to me immediately or their direct supervisor. We have uh, additional cameras in a secured location that we provide them for the remainder of their shift, so there's no question. Okay, but if he's working all day and he realizes that it's not working properly, I mean, does anyone ever monitor it to see that he's recording? You know, that it's very clear and... We there's an indicator whenever you start recording. So if there's a problem, you're going to know that it's not recording. Okay. And just in the on position, for instance, right now, if I put mine in the on position, it goes through a light sequence. I don't know if y'all can see that. At first it showed a red light. Now it is showing, it showed a blue light briefly, telling me that it's doing its little boot up magic process and now it's just a blinking green light. So all that means is that it is powered on and operating correctly. If I keep getting a red light, blue light, green light, something is wrong and I need to go down the camera. And does he still call the auditor? I guess that's what I'm talking about, like. They are pretty hardy. Um, they're pretty hardy. If, if. No. Now they fly off. It is literally stuck to my chest with a magnet. Which also will catch your car keys in case you're interested in that. <laughs> so it's got a magnet bracket and that's still a huge one. So oftentimes if there is a physical confrontation of fight of any sort, uh, some good way to model their seatbelts, uh, and just sit up there. You'll see some officers depending upon their size. They may have the camera mounted a little bit lower. Uh, we've got a guy who's six foot eight, so he puts his camera lower because that's what's going to, to capture the video when uh, pedestrian stops, traffic stops. Um, I'm kind of average size, so I just keep on riding the center of the desk. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right, I think she's finished. All right, so we're going to move on, continuing with uh, transparency, and I'm going to have to pick up the pace a little bit. We are not even halfway through, so bear, bear with me as we, we proceed. Uh, so I talked about the website that we have, the transparency page. All of the uh, things that are listed there are on the, the transparency page, and you know, part of transparency is making resources available to the public. So that's one thing that we do. There's a FAQ, ask the chief, the email goes directly to me and city management, uh, how to file a complaint. We will probably post the, uh, the TCO video on there unless there is uh, copyright issues or something like that. So now I wanna get into uh, response to resistance. Uh, officers must assess each incident to determine whether force is needed and if so, which technique or weapon will bring the incident under control in a safe manner? Force is authorized when officers need to protect themselves or others from physical harm, to restrain or subdue a person resisting arrest or search, to bring an unlawful situation safely and effectively under control, or to prevent a situation from escalating to an incident involving an imminent threat or de of death or serious bodily injury. So I kind of thought it important that I give you the definition of what force is before we kind of get into this. 
So the first thing I'm going to talk about, because a lot of you had questions about eight hey, can't wait, and uh, before I get into it, you know, all these different categories, they're described with two to five words. And uh, you can't describe every incident of a use of force that we may encounter in two to five words. It's simply not possible. So when we talk about, you know, that we, we need to evaluate certain things, they're, they're, we have to look at civil lit litigation and, and things like that before we can uh, get into whether or not we, we change the orders and what we change them to. We run those through legal and, uh, and all of that. So some of these talk about outright bans that are not feasible in the real world. I'll give you an example. So they say to outlaw chokeholds. Well, you can't just say officers can't use a chokehold ever. If I'm on the ground fighting for my life and my weapon has been thrown or I'm on this side and can't get to my weapon, I can use whatever means necessary if I need to utilize deadly force. So we can't just say you can't use chokeholds on someone. If deadly force is authorized, then you can use. We could use our car if deadly force is authorized. So that's just an example of you know how you how you can't really make those broad determinations. Um, the the second bullet is required de-escalation. We talked about that. We first taught it in LPD in 2017. Uh, it's mandated by T. Cole in 2018. And here's what our policy says: Officers shall use de-escalation techniques and other alternatives to higher levels of force consistent with training and when possible and appropriate before resorting to force. When possible and when it does not create a safety issue, officers shall allow an individual time and opportunity to submit to verbal commands before using force. So our officers are taught to utilize every possible avenue before using force. The next thing is uh, require warning before shooting. Uh, this is not currently in our general order. We're consider considering adding the language of when practical and feasible, officers shall make reasonable efforts to identify themselves as a police officer and warn that deadly force may be used prior to the, to the use of deadly force. Uh, we have some concerns with adding that language, practical and feasible because it opens the officers up to civil litigation and potentially the city. So that's something that we need to run through uh, our legal department to see if that verbiage works for that. Uh, and I'll give you an example of it. So uh, the active shooter situation that we talked about earlier, we're not gonna go into that school and uh, probably warn that person that we're fixing a shooting because that person is actively killing so we're gonna go in and the officers are taught that they engage that person with deadly force because that person is using deadly force against another officer. If an officer, if a officer stops a car, and this is one of them that, that we had here, person gets out of the car, reaches back into the car, grabs a weapon and starts shooting at an officer, we're not gonna say, wait, if you don't stop, we're gonna use deadly force. It, so we, we need to evaluate that and a simple statement of require officers to warn before shooting, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, the next one is exhaust all means before shooting, and, and that's kind of the, the same thing. Um, our current general order says officers shall use force that is reasonably necessary to effectively bring an incident under control while protecting the lives of the officer or another. And we're considering adding what's on the slide to that, where it will say in all situations, just justification for the use of deadly force must be limited to the facts reasonably apparent to the officer at the time the officer decides to use force. Deadly force will be used with great restraint as a last resort only and when the level of resistance warrants the use of deadly force. Yes, ma'am. at traffic stops and they tend to escalate and get out of out of hand. So the officer uh, 
think you're reaching for something. You may, a lot of times people are reaching for their driver's license or something else, but the officer sees them reaching and then that causes them to react a certain way. So my question is, what can we do, particularly in those traffic stops, and does the tape when you're talking to young people, because you know, I told my son to keep his hands at two and 10, I don't care how many times they ask you for your driver's license, you can't move your hands. Because if you move your hands, you could be in harm's way. So my question is, how do we deal with, you tell them to get their uh, license, some people keep them in their glove box, some keep, you know, everybody, and some people keep them in their back pockets. So how do we deal with, show me your license, they start reaching, now, yeah. you know, you think it could be a weapon. How, how yeah, and, and, and that's the most dangerous time for a police officer is traffic stops or domestic violence incidents. What I will tell you is the video, that horrible video I talked about earlier, will tell people exactly how to interact with the police. It tells people, just like you said, keep your hands at 10 and 2. When the officer walks up, it tells you why they stopped you, ask for your driver's license, it tells you how to interact with them. If it's in the glove compartment, you tell the officer, my license is in the glove compartment, can I get it? The officer will say yes, you go in the glove compartment and get it. Because you're right, you're, it's midnight 30 and you're walking up on a car with tinted windows and someone's digging around, yeah, the hair on the back of your neck goes, goes on the end. So how do we get this, ninth graders is fine, except they're not driving. So the 18 year old who didn't see this because we didn't have the law, when he got his license or her license, how do we get this information to the general public of how they should respond? Because generally it's not the ninth grader who's getting shot, it's the 18 to 25 year old who, who's encountering a problem. And he or she doesn't know to keep their hands at 10 and two or they forgot what their mama told them about 10 and two. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of people that need to, need to be trained on that. Uh, but someone said it earlier. I, I think it's through a community or a, a community awareness program where we can get that message out. Um, quick question: um, When you approach a vehicle and you, I don't know what the words called, run. Like when you call in, say, mm -hmm. okay, I've just stopped this car and their license plate number is help me. I don't know. So, I don't know. so automatically, who that car is registered to should come up right and it should say that the car is insured. Isn't that all in your database when you pull up the information on the little laptop that's in the car? It is in the database. Uh, so, most why of do they ask for proof of insurance if you already know? that the car is insured based on the information in your car. Because we, we don't know it then. All, we, all the information that we get when we stop a car is they will tell us whether or not there are priors associated with that car. And they'll tell us uh, priors on that call, three traffic stops, or prior on that call, disturbance. And that's all we know whenever we go up. So if we can, oh. if we can get the, the insurance card from the driver, then we don't have to go back and run it through the state system. And if you don't have the card, I'll say, okay, let me let me go find it on the computer, then I can look. So if you forgot your card, I've, I've changed out purses, I don't have my card, I don't have my driver's license, I can then go in the computer and look it up. I can look up your driver's license and I can look up your insurance. Yeah, and what they come back and tell us is that insurance has been verified. Yeah, if we run the plate, we don't always run the plate whenever we stop a car. In oh, fact, okay. very rarely do we run the plate before we stop a car. Yes. To, uh, to tack on to what uh, Ms. Saunders was asking, that seminar, the webinar that Dallas and Fort Worth was putting on was more directed towards the public to young adults, and I believe the age requirement was 16 to 25. 
So then that would kind of include, as she said, those who uh, didn't partake in that when it first came out. So uh, I think if you had something similar to that where you could offer it to the general public, anybody that wanted to sign up for it, they didn't necessarily have to be in high school. Yeah, I uh, think that's a great would make idea. it beneficial. Okay, one more question. So you get a call from 7-Eleven, and um, the guy's complaining that that guy left out with a, a soda and a bag of chips. And so he's running. Do you run after him? Do you shoot him? I mean, what do you do? I mean, uh, I'm just asking. Right. Because people are, are getting shot more. So people aren't, don't, police aren't running after him anymore. They're shooting him. And so you see it all the time. I'm just asking, what is your process? Yeah, and what, I'll get into our stats here in the city of Louisville and, and uh, about what's happening in other places. But yeah, we'll pursue that person. There's a crime that's been violated. It's our obligation to enforce that law. If that person doesn't comply with our commands, then they may be tased, tackled. You know, it depends on, on the situation. But shooting them is not the first step? No. I mean, I'm, I'm just asking. No, I, no, it's not. No, that's a, <laughs> that, thank you for asking that. That's a, that's a movie thing. Uh, where you shoot people in the arm and oh, knock, the leg. Knock, knock the gun out. And yeah, yeah. It, it's not real world. I always ask that because, you know, we always shoot to kill. And I know you're taught that to sh when you're using deadly force. But I'm always wondering, especially if someone's running away or something, can we not just shoot them in the leg and instead of shooting them in the bag or whatever? Yeah, and, and you said something there, Commissioner. So we are taught to... Uh, to shoot to stop the threat. And the way we stop the threat is by shooting center mass. That's the way people typically will go down. It's not like the movies where people fly backwards and, and all of that whenever they get shot. It, if, if I'm shot in the chest, I could probably still run and make it to, to her or him or probably across this room. So that's why you see multiple shots being fired at someone. That threat is still coming. Uh, Melinda was just asking about shooting in the back. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of examples out there, and, and it does happen. And whenever you look at it, if, if I'm running away from someone and I'm shooting back at the police officer, and that police officer shoots at me, he's going to hit me in the back. And whenever you review the video, that's where you determine, okay, there was a threat. He was pointing a gun backwards, shooting at me, and that's why he ended up shot in the back. Yeah, so we always try to use command presence whenever we stop someone. We ask them to stop, we tell them to stop, and then we have to make them stop. So if someone's running away from us, we don't automatically go to our less than lethal rounds. If we can grab that person, we'll grab them and tackle them to the ground or, or stop them in whatever manner. But it, at the point it becomes a, a physical resistance, then we will use less lethal means to control people. Oh, I'm sorry. Last question, because my chest is just hurting with this. I'm just, my chest is hurting. So if someone is breaking into my home and I have a license to carry and the gun is in my home and someone is breaking in, is it true that I have to wait until they get inside my house to protect myself and my children? Or can I shoot them while they're on the outside at my window or the door trying to come in? Yeah, and I, and I don't give legal advice, but what I would tell you is I would not shoot someone outside of my house. Even if they're trying, if they're on my camera trying to come in, I have to wait until they come in and I probably go into straight cardiac arrest. And now I'm a victim or my children are now victims to something. Now, if, if you're there, 
I would give them commands to not come in, that you've got a gun. Oh, and, they gonna listen. Oh, okay. And then, and then if they keep coming in, yeah, once they, once they break the, the plane of that window or enter into your home, you don't have a duty to retreat. All right, I will, oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna ask, you know, when you, the, the example that she gave of the 7-Eleven, um, probably it's gonna be a class C misdemeanor. I guess, I, my question is, the person is running. They still only sold, stole $20 and you make a reasonable pursuit, I, I guess I can never see why you would want to shoot that person. Because you don't know whether they have a gun or not if, the, if they say they just walked out with chips and, and a soft drink. I guess I can never conceive the fact that that person's in better shape than me, the police officer, and can run faster and jump higher, and so I'm slower. But I just can't see shooting that person for that particular crime. I certainly can see when it's something that's physically dangerous to people around that you're gonna to have to really use your weapon. But my question is, for particularly property type crimes, you know, it's just hard for me to believe that people should be dying for a property crime. And yeah, so they got them on campus. I think I'm, I'm following with what you're asking. Uh, a lot of that is dictated by the person. I mean, if we say, we're not going to chase people that run from us. Everyone's going to run from us. And we are a lawful society, and we have to try to enforce those laws. There are times where things get too dangerous, and we call off pursuits and things like that. Uh, but that's whenever there's other dangers that, that the, public, the public may be put in jeopardy. But we've got, we've got to try to make that arrest. Um, just real quick, so since we are being transparent about racial equity here, this is a question that I've always wanted to ask, and I guess this, this is the best forum for it, um, because, we, I mean, we, we're all privy to it. We see it on the, on the news, and I know this has not happened in the city of Louisville, but by you being a police officer, maybe you can provide some insight um, behind the psyche or as to why this happens, but just... Um, and like I said, since, since we're talking about racial equity, so I've always wanted to ask the question, we see on the news where we may have a black person unarmed and shot and killed. And then you may have a non-black person with a gun threatening the officer up in the officer's face or running around or pointing the gun and everything and always apprehended, never killed. And so since we're being transparent, I, I just want to know what's up with that. I mean, it's very disheartening as a black woman to see, and, and I know the media can make it or break it. You know, the media is just what, what it is. Television is telling a vision of what the media wants you to see, but it's not lying when it shows those incidents because it does show the video of compliance of an unarmed black person and then you may have a white person that is, have a gun, running, pointing the gun. There's a video out there, one white guy running, pointing the gun, yelling and screaming and everything like that. And he's apprehended and taken in, no bullets or what, or what have you, or not taken in in a body bag. So I know this hasn't happened here in Louisville, and I am honored to hear that you said that you're gonna make sure it's not gonna happen, but since we're here in this forum, I would just like to ask, what is your take on that? Or, or, or is that not being implicit bias is that, at that point? You know, I, I don't know the, all the examples of, of that occurring. It depends on what the person's doing with the gun. If the person has it down to their side and they're not pointing it, the example you gave was they were pointing, pointing it at people. Pointing at, at people and the police officer. Yeah, that, then deadly force is authorized and... I can't imagine someone not using deadly force for that situation. I could send you videos to show it where it's never happened, even with mass murderers being apprehended and not being riddled with bullets and everything like that. So like I said, since we're being transparent, talking about racial equity, I just wanted to get your take on how, why the discrepancy when it comes to that. 
And I don't know the answer to it. I mean, uh, I, I don't have any stats on that. I will tell you, I don't know about those two, but whenever I've encountered someone with a gun, the only thing I saw was a gun until it was over. All right, so uh, the next slide on the, the A Can't Wait is due to, inter to intervene. That's something that, that I've always preached on uh, whenever I first was appointed chief, and I never really thought to put it in, into policy until the A Can't Wait, so we have added that to our policy, and I won't read it all to you, but you can see at the very end, any, any failure to intervene and or failure to report improper use of force shall be grounds for discipline up to and including termination. So that is in our policy at this time. Uh, the next thing they talk about is ban, ban shooting at motor vehicles. Uh, we already addressed this in our general orders. We did add let me back up. We, it, it has been in our general orders. We had it banned that you could not shoot at moving vehicles. Uh, whenever all of the vehicle attacks started happening, like the one in New York where the guy's going down the sidewalk hitting people, uh, we added a caveat that if the vehicle was being used as deadly force, that we then could shoot at the vehicle. So uh, once again, we can't just have an outright ban on shooting at motor vehicles. We have to have some reasonableness there, and I think we've, um, I think we've got it. What we have taught all, all of our people, because we started seeing a pattern probably about 10, 15 years ago, and uh, it even developed a name. It's called Officer Created Jeopardy. And what that is, is if I pull up to, a, to an assault call, say, and uh, a person is getting in a vehicle and they're leaving the, the scene and I try to stop them. So I jump out in front of them and tell them to stop. They keep coming to me. That's an officer created jeopardy. I need to get the heck out of the way. So uh, what we do is we train our officers on officer created jeopardy, not to put yourselves in a position where you may end up having to use deadly force. So that is something that we, we talk about and, and teach our officers. Uh, the last thing on that one is the require the use of a continuum. Uh, our department does not have a continuum at this point. Uh, most police departments had those in the 1980s and probably all the way up to about 2000. Most departments stopped using those because research showed that uh, it was not practical. The, I'll go ahead and switch slides. Well, I want to go to this slide. So this is what a continuum looks like. And every department that has one has their own because they got to put their name on it, right? So what, what continuum is the right one to use? I mean, one, there are so many of them out there that, you know, if you wanted to have a continuum, which one do you go with? Which one would be accepted? Which one wouldn't? But I recently read this article uh, and it basically says, you know, what, what's old is new again. You know, we've been there and done that and got away from it. And the reason we got away from it was that continuums had the unintended result of increasing uses of force. So that's the reason we don't have a continuum. Uh, continuums were only meant to be used as a training aid to let officers be able to compare this level of force, then you use this level of force, and things like that. They challenge the effective decision-making made by officers and a stair-stepping methodology. It, it doesn't work in the real world. Uh, and Courtney, when we were, we were talking about this uh, earlier this week, last week, uh, she had the perfect example. Uh, so you want to tell them your example? Which one was the chief? The, uh, the use of force, talking about the use of force continuing the guy with the so I'm standing there five foot seven, 128 pounds with a big dude with a knife. And he's about where you're sitting, okay? He is not necessarily a threat to me. This is where I'm gonna engage in verbal dialogue, probably try to put something between us so that if he lunges, he can't get to me physically. 
If I don't have a barrier of some sort, um, I'm going to need to be 15 to 20 feet from him to be safe. Still not feeling safe with a dude with a, with a knife. Um, I, my officer presence should be the first thing that makes him go bloop and drop the knife. If officer presence doesn't work, dialogue has to start taking place. If dialogue doesn't work, then I'm either going to go to a secondary weapon, being a taser, OC spray, something of that nature, um, or if he continues to, to engage me and move in on me, now he's basically left with me no choice but to use deadly force, which would be my firearm. So um, the, the use of force continuum, oftentimes when you, you start with the verbal officer presence, the verbal dialogue, and then you're thinking in your head, I need to go to the next, which is taser or spray. But suddenly he puts the knife down and he sits down and he's behaving. Where the threat is like hardly even there anymore. Officers were forgetting to come back down to that dialogue. They kept thinking, got to go up a notch, go up a notch, go up a notch. They were forgetting to come back down. And so um, I think that's why we, we kind of got away from these models because as soon as that person who is physically close to you starts doing what you want them to do, you absolutely start coming back down. Let's go to talking. Let's go to stepping away from the knife and, and handling it that way. De-escalation. The other part of that example is if you're using a use of force continuum, that person's got a knife, that's deadly force. According to the continuum, you shoot that person. And I don't think anybody wants that whenever there's not a, not a real threat. So you have to be able to give officers the, the authority to make split se second decisions and trust their training that they're gonna do the, do the right thing. Uh, the next slide is comprehensive reporting. Uh, we already do that, it's required in our general orders. Uh, gives you a few examples of uh, when you have to report response to resistance. And basically it's any time uh, someone alleges an injury or they're injured or any time a less lethal uh, weapon is used. Uh, so let's get into the types of force that we have used. So this is 2019. We had 39 uses of force in 2019. Uh, we had 32 taser deployments, five physical holds, and two open strikes. We had over 61,000 calls for service in 2019. So we used force 0.06% of all police encounters. 0.06. Not 6%, but 0.06. So that's something that I'm proud of. I think our officers use great restraint whenever it comes to use of force. Uh, and we, we continue that by providing the, the training that we do. Uh, so this is the, the force that was used, those 39. These are the races of those 39. 16 were white, 12 were black, eight were Hispanic, and one was Asian. So now I wanna talk about uh, deadly force that we have used against a suspect. So the, this is uh, whenever we have sh actually shot someone. Uh, so let me start off with what is deadly force? Deadly force is force applied in any manner by any means that could be reasonably believed to cause death or serious bodily injury. When can deadly force be used? To protect themselves or others from what is reasonably believed to be an immediate threat of death or city, serious bodily injury. So you look the first one, 1999, uh, that was a suspect, carjacked a victim, put the victim in the trunk. This all happened at a car wash on uh, Round Grove Road. Uh, suspect then went, it, went to a bank down the street, robbed the bank. Uh, we're starting to get calls on it. Officers located the suspect vehicle in the area. He pointed a handgun at the officers and the officers shot him. Uh, he, he survived the, the gunshot wounds, transported to the hospital, uh, ended up uh, going to court, and while at court, attempted to take a weapon away from the bailiff and uh, another bailiff came in and shot him. So he, he was shot and killed at the courthouse. Uh, 2007, 
We had a detective escorting a kidnapping sexual assault victim to Denton Regional for a SANE exam. On the way up there, he noticed a car following him the whole way. So he radioed to us and Denton PD because he's headed north. Uh, Radio Denton PD, took the exit to Denton Regional. The car took the exit, but kept going. But then he saw the car take the, the next turn in and started coming back. So Denton PD is arriving on the scene. The detective goes up with the victim to the emergency room entrance. The suspect, uh, that was the suspect in the, the sexual assault and kidnapping, circles through the, the ER drive and fires three shots at the detective. Detective returns fire, didn't strike the person. Uh, Denton PD continues uh, and pursues that person to the Oklahoma-Texas border where he ran into an IHOP and uh, I think held some people there for a short time and then ultimately committed suicide in the IHOP. Uh, 2008, officers were dispatched to a bar fight where a person uh, displayed a handgun. As the officers are arriving, that person is walking out of the bar with the gun in his hand. He ignores officers' commands, puts the gun in the back of his waist, gets in the car, still disregards orders, and starts driving towards the officers, and one of the officers returned or shot at the vehicle, trying to get him to stop. Uh, we never did locate that guy, so we're assuming that he was not hit, but uh, we never did f uh, find the vehicle or him. Uh, 2011, suspect was pursued by officers for a DWI. He finally stopped and got out of his vehicle, reached back in the vehicle, grabbed a handgun, brought it out, and started shooting towards officers. Uh, two officers on the scene returned gunfire, striking the suspect in the legs. Like Ms. Mitchell said, shoot him in the leg. Uh, so shot, shot him in the leg a couple of times, and, and that person ultimately lived. So uh, that's roughly over a 20-year time frame, and we had uh, four deadly force incidents where we shot someone and they did not die. Uh, all those investigations were done by internal affairs, and then we did, had an outside agency that comes in and does the criminal part of those investigations, and that was the Texas Rangers. Uh, so these are the deadly force incidents that we have had that involve death of someone. Uh, so the first one was October 2012. Uh, we were dispatched to an aggravated assault at the McDonald's on Round Grove. Uh, suspect threatened a customer in the drive-thru. Officers located him a short distance away and tried to stop him. Uh, he got out of the vehicle with a handgun, had it down to his side. The officers didn't, didn't shoot immediately. Uh, he raised the gun towards one of the officers, and the officer shot, it, shot, and, shot and killed him at that point. Uh, the next one was uh, November 2014. Uh, suspect stole a vehicle in Highland Village, uh, got in a road rage, road rage incident with a car on 35, uh, pointed a shotgun at that driver. Uh, the driver contacted us at that point, and I believe Highland Village had also contacted us because he was heading into our city. Uh, he got out of his vehicle, went and stole another vehicle, and we saw him leaving the area. We pursued him uh, to a convenience store on Round Grove Road. He got out with a shotgun, fired one round at our officers, and our officer returned fire, shooting and killing him. Uh, before that, the only other, or before those two, the only other one that we had was in 1984. So those are the only deadly force incidents that we have had in our city. And once again, all of those are investigated by our, our internal affairs. They're turned over to the Texas Rangers for an independent investigation. And all, all deadly force incidents are referred to the district attorney's office. They uh, send those to the grand jury, and the officer is either true build or no build. Uh, one thing I want to I want to mention too. So when, when we do have to shoot and kill someone, that's a homicide, and that's the way it's reported. So if you hear that there, the person died of homicide, well, th that's right, but there's justifiable homicide. So if you see that, don't automatically assume that that's a criminal act because all shooting deaths are homicides. All right, so now we'll go into our complaint process.
We may make it through. I'm hopeful yet. Uh, lost my place. All right. So we'll go into our complaint process. Uh, yeah. Before we move on, I want to ask the group, because we are just past 8.30. We can continue with Kevin's stuff. I mean, we're, we're on over time. But if you're antsy and need to go and got plans and want to continue this next week, we can push the schedule back so you have more time next week. We'll just shift everything back a week. We save this room an extra week just in case. So getting a feel for the room, do you want to just keep on pushing through? Or do you want to take the rest of the lease and do it next week? How many slides do have? I am on 46, and I've got 69. Some of those are placeholder slides. I think these will actually go pretty quick. And you do have it. It fits in your copy. Yes, you do have a copy. So I'll try to go through them quickly if that's all right with you. We're okay. Yes. If you do have to leave, we understand you have a presentation. You're back to the next back, so I'm not going to get yours to you because your email said it was too big. So we'll find a way. Um, you have it. Any questions, comments, ideas, suggestions? This goes for also for the online group. Anything you want to, just send it to me if you don't have time to talk to us tonight. And we can always build in some time for questions and answers at another session. So we'll take care of it. And we have a few gentlemen that have suddenly asked their questions before. I want to make sure you get them before. Okay. So two people have mine. We'll get you. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. All right. So uh, first thing, all of our complaints that come in are investigated, whether they're internal or, ex or external complaints. Uh, complaints against officers must be made in writing for us to be able to discipline that officer. And that's a state law requirement. That's Government Code 614. Uh, and any employee receiving a complaint will refer the complaining person to a supervisor. And all of that is in our general orders that spells out that uh, our employees are, um, are not allowed to try to talk people out of filing a complaint. That's against our general orders. So we have two different types of complaints. The first one is a class, class one complaint. Those are the more serious complaints and those are investigated by our, our internal affairs division. And though, I'll make this real quick. So those are some examples of class one complaints. And they're the, they're the ones that you would think of whenever you think of serious complaints. Uh, class two complaints. Those are the more minor complaints that deal with discourtesy, improper procedures, officers driving poorly, and those are, are typically handled by frontline supervisors like uh, uh, Sergeant Latalian and Sergeant Noble. Uh, when we do investigate all these complaints, uh, we, we have to assign them a disposition. So these are the four dispositions that we have. The first one is unfounded, and that's the allegation is false or not, not factual. Exonerate, I can't talk now. Exonerated, uh, the incident did occur, but it was legal and proper, not sustained insufficient evidence to either prove or disprove the allegation, and then sustained is an allegation is supported by sufficient evidence. So now let's talk about our discipline. Uh, I just went back two years on our discipline, so it's 2019 and 2020. You can see the, the categories for each year below the respective years. Um, and I think yours has, uh, for 2023 suspensions, uh, that's up to four now. I had to suspend someone uh, yesterday for uh, excessive tardiness or excessive uh, attendance issues. So you can see uh, what we do in a, in a typical year. Uh, this next slide, this is on our transparency page, so I don't expect you to, to be able to read it. Uh, but these are all the people that have been terminated or resigned in lieu of termination. Uh, that five years? Over the last five years. Uh, so there's 13 on that list. Four were fired or resigned after being arrested. Uh, two of those that were arrested, they were arrested for DWI, one for PI, and one for deadly conduct. Uh, the deadly, deadly conduct, the, that officer was out in West Texas on his, because it sounds bad, I want to explain it a little bit, it's bad enough, but uh, he was out in West Texas uh, on his parents' land shooting and shot towards another property property line or shot across his property line and ended up striking a person in the arm that was on uh, his neighbor's property. So uh, he was indicted by the, the authorities in that county. So uh, he was terminated for that. 
Uh, four were from, uh, four were after external complaints. Uh, one of those four, we referred to another agency, and that person was subsequently arrested for criminal activity. Uh, five of our complaints that involved termination or resignations in lieu of terminations came from internal sources. So, so we take great pride in policing our own. I know that's not the case everywhere, but five of those came from internal sources. One of those was referred to another agency uh, for criminal investigation. Uh, one of them that's listed was for falsifying probable cause for an arrest, and uh, that was after a body-worn camera review. Uh, Courtney, uh, or Sergeant Battalion, they do body-worn camera reviews every so often. Uh, they do it every bid and every month, and they just randomly go into the system and review body-worn cameras. So uh, she went into the system a while back. I'll do her example here real quick. Uh, but she went into the system, started reviewing a body-worn camera, and it was an officer that was dealing with a homeless person that was at one of our uh, bars. That person got, got the, the lady out of the bar and talked terribly to the person, quite honestly, uh, used language that, that I would not appreciate. Uh, but whenever he arrested her, he pushed her against the, the squad car and split her head open. So Courtney found out about it. Uh, she did what most of our people will always do, and that she, she reported it to the chain of command. So we opened up an internal affairs investigation, and that person was terminated. Uh, an another one that was found through a, a body-worn camera review was after an arrest, uh, the officer said one thing in his written report. When the supervisor reviewed it, the, the video showed quite something quite different. So that person uh, falsified the probable cause for the arrest. So we terminated that person as well. So all of those are online, so you uh, have access to those. And we're going to continue that process on our transparency page to keep everyone notified. Uh, so racial profiling and crime stats, uh, real quickly. Uh, you may think so, uh, racial profiling uh, requirements are something new. It's actually not. It goes back to 2001. It has been amended several times over the years. Uh, the last time was in 2017 when the Sandra Bland Act was passed. Uh, in 2021, I expect something uh, to be added to uh, that law at that time as well. So uh, something we did in 2018, uh, we contracted with, uh, and it happens to be the guy that is the architect of Texas racial profiling law. Uh, he works with universities and, uh, and helped the, the legislatures, legislators write that law. So um, he has a, a, a side hustle, I guess, uh, doing this. So uh, we contracted with him and to make sure that we comply with all, all facets of the, the racial profiling law. And we do, and that is also on our transparency page. We've been doing it since 2018 and have not had any issues with it. Uh, so these are the stops by race. 46% uh, of our stops were on white people. 24% were on black people. Uh, Hispanics, 22%. Asian Pacific Islanders, 8% and Alaskan American Indian less than 1%. Uh, these are just some of the, the summary of, of the findings from Dr. Del Carmen. Uh, basically, that says that we comply with uh, everything in the Tex Texas racial profiling law. And we also do quarterly reports, uh, qu uh, quarterly audits, I'm sorry, uh, that we do every year on that as well. So these are the, uh, someone had asked in a, in a question that I got was, uh, they wanted some crime stats about arrest. So th these are the arrests by race for 2019. 35% uh, of our arrests were white, 34% were black, 28% were Hispanic, 3% were Asian, and the rest all had less than 1%. You know, the, the, the crimes that Cause the most concern for the, the community or, or the, our homicides. And a couple of years ago, we had a, 
a stretch where we had more homicides. If we have one, it's more than I like, but we had definitely had some, and uh, so it creates concerns uh, for public safety. So these are the murder victims by race uh, over the last five years. So over the last five years, we've had 13 homicides. Uh, seven of those victims were black, three were white, and three were Asian or Pacific Islander. So the suspects in those homicides, uh, and some of these homicides had multiple suspects, uh, but 12 were black, two were unknown, and three were white. Uh, so we, I'll talk a little bit, that's over the last five years or since 25, 2015. Uh, so far this year, we've had two homicides. Uh, one was a capital murder that occurred on April 20th. That was a robbery at the 7-Eleven store on Valley Ridge. Uh, two unknown males shot the clerk. Uh, the victim called 911, described them as being two black males. Uh, he later succumbed to his injuries before, uh, before officers were able to arrive. Uh, we also had a capital murder on May 31st. Uh, this was at one of our apartment complexes off of Round Grove Road. Uh, a 21-year-old black male was a victim of that homicide. Uh, the two suspects were was an 18-year-old black male and a 20-year-old black male. We believe that one uh, was drug-related based on what the uh, suspect told us. Uh, caller heard about 10 gunshots. Officers were able to locate and stop the vehicle a short distance away, and we were able to recover the murder weapon from that traffic stop. Uh, next, we'll talk about the budget. So these are all funds. The city has numerous funds that, that we get things from. Some of it's property tax, some general, general fund, crime control prevention di district. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't have to deal with all those others. Uh, so when you look at all of that, the 29% uh, of the uh, entire budget is devoted to public safety. So that's us, fire department, emergency management, 16% uh, of the city's total budget is for police. The next slide just gives you a, a, a breakdown of, of how much in each area. All of those are accounts that we have within the police department. Some of them are special operations, criminal investigations, traffic, things like that. That just tells you how much money uh, goes into each one of those. Uh, this is a breakdown just to show you that 88% of our budget is for salary and benefits. Uh, next, so uh, mid-year 2019, we went to council and uh, they graciously authorized us to be able to perform a staffing study uh, to see, you know, if, if there were, basically to evaluate the, the performance of the PD and see if we needed additional personnel. Uh, we received our final report in 2019 uh, this is a summary of the findings. Uh, the ones that have the check mark are ones that we have been able to do thus far. You'll see some of the, the words in green. That's where we're making some progress. So uh, we're, we're definitely making strides. The, the staffing study said we needed uh, a lot more positions and we needed to civilianize some of our positions that we did have. So. Um, we're, our plan going forward, not this budget year, because uh, because of COVID, uh, you know, property tax and everything else is kind of in limbo. Uh, but we do have plans going forward. We've got a, a police officer that is doing uh, victims advocate work. Uh, so we'll we'll find a citizen probably to do that. We've already civilianized the management level that was over. Some of our civilian services, it seemed logical to have a civilian over that. And then some of it's over, over the next 10 year period. So with that, I know I've said it before, but I'll say it again real quick. I really urge you all to, to participate in the Citizens Police Academy. Uh, we started doing those in 1989, uh, which coincidentally is my first, first year in law enforcement. So that's about 32 years. Uh, we completed 42 courses over that time frame. Uh, it's 13 weeks of instruction, and over the, the time, the, over the 42 courses, 
we've been able to reach about 850 citizens. So I think it's a great program. I really think you all would get a lot out of it. So with that, I will entertain any questions you may have. Could you, could you tell me uh, why we don't have any motorcycle officers? Uh, motorcycles are inherently dangerous. Uh, Chief Kerbo, whenever he was here, he disbanded the program. Uh, that was after um, a motorcycle officer in Flower Mound was, uh, was he killed or something? Yeah, he, w he was severely injured. And uh, we've had some officers injured on motorcycles. So um, he just felt that, that we didn't need them any longer and that we could do the job as well as we did with motorcycles and ha have them work out of cars. I want to step back just a little bit. There you are. <laughs> I'm like, where is that coming from? I want to step back just a little bit to the uh, crime scene and give information. And the gentleman behind me, I can't think of his name, said some of the same comments I said that, that I felt that I was planning on saying that. I think you all are doing an outstanding job of presenting and showing us some things that you all are doing. I think it's absolutely great. And I have had uh, commands where twice I've had the police under me, and I don't like calling them cops either. You all are policemen, and I appreciate that. And the thing is, what? Policemen and women, yes. Yes, policemen and women. Police officers. Police officers. How about police officers? Will that work? That works. Okay. The thing is, as long as the police officers are taught and enforced on how to treat and they're vetted and how they handle the, the description, the races, I don't see a problem. But I know that my police officers' spouses want to see them come, come home every day. And if they've been called out, they need the best possible information. So if it is a black man, if it's a white man, or anywhere in between, they need the best description because it may be the difference in their life and somebody else's life being saved. So as long as they're taught and reinforced, then I have no problem with that. But you all need the best information that you can when you're responding because you don't know what else you're going to see and you need to be able to sort it out. Thank you. Okay, so when um, you get a written complaint, how do you guys respond back to the, um, the person that wrote the complaint after you go through your process? Yeah, so uh, we start the complaint, the, the supervisor takes all the information, they look into the complaint, Whenever we have a disposition, supervisors are always told to contact that person back, give them the disp disposition of the complaint, and then it's sent up through the chain of command. And then uh, one other question, contractual debt. So um, I saw that that was part of one of your requirements. The hiring process. I mean, so do you take anything into consideration? Does a person get a chance to explain it? We do, we do, and, and that's not an automatic disqualifier. It will depend on, we, we, we've had some that they were working on resolutions and, and they provided proof that they were on a, a payment plan or whatever to reduce that debt, and we were able to hire them. Yeah, Chief, very, very good information. Um, my son and I had a conversation not too long ago that turned into a pre pretty heated argument. You can have the best processes in the world. You can vet the police officers before you hire them. You can train them. We're all human beings. There are still going to be times when some things take place. I guess the thing that I really uh, appreciate the most is that you've got a pretty good system here of checks and balances. And one of the things that uh, they mentioned last week was that the police officers here in Louisville don't belong to a union. And, you know, in corporate America, unions is a bad thing because that kind of puts a wedge 
between management and the non-management personnel, and it makes it difficult for them to be able to hold them accountable. It's, it's, it's refreshing to see that that doesn't take place here, and as these things come up, you guys are able to take action very, very quickly, because when you look at the things that happen across this country, while they were bad, I think one of the things that made those things worse was the response that nothing happened immediately. Uh, there wasn't, you know, a show of support. Matter of fact, in some cases, the unions even defended some of the actions that the police officers took. Well, that's their job. They defend them every time. Exactly. And I think here, that's one of the things that was fresh in the sea, that you guys are able to manage these situations because I don't care how strong of processes you put in place. We're human beings, and there are going to be people who break those processes. Absolutely. Uh, I believe we have Calvin on the Zoom call that wants to ask a question. Yes, I've got a question. Did I see a slide which said that 34% of the arrests in 2019 were of black people? Did I see that? Uh, I will go back and verify that number. Yeah, arrest by race, uh, white was 35%, black 34%, Hispanic 28%, and 3% Asian. Yeah, I thought I saw that. My question is, have you broken it down into the nature of those arrests? And then the second question is, does not appear to be a high number based on the black percentage of population? And have you broken it down into black men? That number probably would be even higher. Yeah, we, we do have the ability to break those down. I didn't do all offenses. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to see that, Chief. Okay, we can get, we can get that out to you, definitely. And my question is, do you feel that's a little excessive? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. That it depends on what the crimes are. Uh, and the crimes aren't always representative of the, the population, uh, especially when you look at a metropolitan area like Louisville. Uh, you know, we're in the DFW area. So what... Well, what you have to kind of look at is what is uh, what are the demographics for that race in the whole DFW area, but I think we you know we talked about this I believe the the first week where you know the, the different aspects of, of society have failed people, and I think that it has led to some young black men you mentioned specifically uh, that it has led them into crime. Were all the arrests, did the people live in Louisville? I, I don't have that information. Okay, because that, that would make a difference also whether they lived in Louisville or maybe you arrested from some other city. Yeah, and yeah. I, I can tell you that, that they didn't. Uh, in fact, uh, the two people that we arrested for the, the capital murder uh, down off Round Grove, that was a 2020 arrest. Both those people were from Dallas. Tracy. I think, um, I think um, the, the uh, Essence hand was up much longer than mine. I can wait and let her go. Okay, Essence, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah. I like, I can go now. Um, I didn't really have many questions. I just wanted more so to respond to a few things from earlier and then offer perspective of a different solution. Um, earlier, I heard someone talk about how they don't like the word cops and they see, they think it like dehumanizes them. And I just wanted to elaborate on, some of us have started to see cops as other than human because we see a problem, a clear problem in, policing that a lot of them have a God complex. And I agree that we're all just humans and that at the end of the day, since we're all humans, none of us should have that much power. We should be looking at um, what it will look like if we divvied up some of that power and worked on building the community up, eliminating the need to commit crime and thus less need for police. Um, another thing is earlier, um, someone spoke about 
that you guys still get cops uh, calls of people saying they just see a black man walking down the street, nothing else. Um, and I think that shows more than anything that white people know and see the police as a weapon, a weapon that works on their side. It also shows that there's a fear of crime in the community, obviously, especially in places like Texas where people are holding on really tight to their guns and they want to know what their rights are if someone comes in their house. There's, you know, still, still plenty of fear of crime in the community. And I think that is also evident of us not having a perfect policing system and, you know, us still needing to improve upon it in some way. So I think it's worth a chance to explore alternative response and how that could look and things like that. Um, and I also see that we're talking a lot about policy and that's all well and good. And that's a part of change, but we've been tweaking policy for generations and generations and there's still a problem, problem enough for us to be here um, and for countless others to wanna be here and a part of that conversation. So, you know, I'm listening to the policies that we have right now and I hear what sounds perfect, it sounds great. I don't have any other policy to add, to be honest. Um, so I really think the problem is policing. I think that um, it's time to explore bigger change. And I know that's scary. And also see that, or I would like to remind you guys, I kind of mentioned it last time that I'm on the side more of defunding the police, which is really just reducing funding and I understand, and I can imagine that as a cop or a police, if I heard that, I would feel like, you know, my job is at stake. My security, my financial security is at stake. Um, and I sense that as any human being, you guys are getting defensive and you're wanting to rush into survival mode and protect your job. Um, and that's understandable, but I wanted to offer the perspective of defunding the police doesn't necessarily mean that you will lose your job. It could mean that your job may look different. It doesn't mean that you can't serve your community and make money off of that um, and protect your community. It just might mean your job title is different. Your job looks different. And that shouldn't be a problem if your real priority is protecting your community and not just having a, like a leadership position. So I just wanted to offer that perspective. My next thing, um, I wanted to be honest, a lot of people, including myself, don't really trust the police right now. So being right here and having to take you guys' word for how you respond to things and we never turn off our cameras and we can't change video. We see how that's not true all the time. I'm not saying, I don't know any of you personally. I don't hear about terrible things happening in Louisville, but I know it happens across the country. So I just wanted to kind of talk about Let's see, sorry. How, honestly, this conversation is a nice start, but the problem is people don't trust you at this point. And there's nobody holding the police accountable that doesn't work for the government system. And it doesn't really matter that individual people in the system aren't consciously making racist decisions. You just being a part of it, you doing your job is innately, um, you, pushing forward a racist system and it's in this day and age we can't fake like the system isn't racist or that it's you know it's just militant black people who believe that because we have a president who shows it every day he's messy and he's exposing the system every day so it's not something we can act like isn't happening um and we've seen countless times that it's not something that oh i as a black cop can go in and change the system from the from within um, as we've been told countless times in these sessions, you guys don't have that much power, not in Louisville, to affect the federal federal government, not as one police officer to affect everything, not as one of us, one civilian to affect it. Um, we can just use our voices. So um, I think my main thing is, I mean, I don't have all the answers. I'm only 20. I don't. I'm not in government or politics, but I do do a lot of research and reading, and I think it's worth just consideration to do the work of investing in social communities more, social community organizations, I mean, 
um, exploring what it could look like to have alternative forms of emergency response um, and to give those same people the same support in funding that we give police officers. Maybe they should be the people getting bought lunch and things like that as well. And yes, I believe that's all I had to say. And that's Since I got two quick follow-up questions for you. I think you just answered one. Um, when you mentioned defund the police has different meaning for a lot of different people. I was going to ask kind of what you picture. At the end, you talked about alternative enforcement, alternative response. Is that what you're talking about when you talk about defund? Yeah. So when people say defund the police, I know it, like, again, it sounds, you know, really radical and crazy. We just have a purge, everyone running free. But no, many times what people, what we, all that we mean is taking some of that funding away and investing into community organizations that are on the ground working with the people, um, trying to fix the community, the problems within the community that cause people to feel like they need to commit crime or, and it also is about exploring the idea of divvying up the police's job, not having them be the person that responds to potential robbery, mur homicide, and a homeless person and a mental health, per uh, someone, in a mental health crisis or anything like that. Um, just <laughs> reacclimating funds and reimagining our system. And it's radical and a lot more work than changing policy, but I think it's 2020 and we have the same issues from 1960s, from 1918, um, from before I can even imagine. So it's time to reimagine the whole thing in my opinion. Okay, thank you. I think we understand better now on that. And the other item, you made a comment about the lack of trust that I think we all know is out there. And you specifically mentioned an example about the body-worn cameras that we said officers can't turn them off, that we can't go in and change the video and so forth. And you said, yeah, that sounds great, but how do you know that? How can we believe that? So my question to you, that might not be one you can answer now, is what steps could Louisville Police Department take to build the kind of trust that those things are true? That's the thing. Um, and again, I don't have all the answers, but that's why I think there's a problem with government and that no one is held, holding police accountable, but, you know, other people, a part of the government who have, you know, similar goals and work together and depend on each other for jobs. I think the only answer I have is us having more of a community like community-based, I don't want to use the word government, but like a team, a system of people who are, we're holding each other accountable. Not all, all of us work for each other. Not all of us are depending on this for income or um, our well-being. Um, and that's all I have at the moment, but I will continue to think on that. But that's, that's part of the problem, in my opinion, is that I, I can't think of anything you guys could do to make me trust you. <laughs> because of what we see countlessly in the media. What was that? Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll be really quick. Um, I think what um, I look at her, she looks like a little baby to me, um, Essence. Uh, I appreciate your thoughts. And I guess I think what she's mentioning is uh, it's called a um, community uh, accountability. It's what Dallas, the city of Dallas has, where they have citizens in the community who come in for oversight. They also sit on committees uh, with the police officers when there is uh, something that's going on in the community. So the city of Dallas has uh, that committee in place and that may be something that she may be, uh, have some knowledge of just from watching the news and it's comprised of citizens having an oversight for police actions and that's something that's new in the city of Dallas. But what my two questions, I'm not sure of how rank works. I've, we've heard sergeants and chiefs, that's all I know. So is there, I know there has to be something in between that. So as far as the promotability, you know, I haven't seen any assistant chiefs that were African American. Uh, I see a lot of sergeants and that's in all cities, but very seldom do you see uh, chiefs or assistant chiefs or other decision makers that are of African American descent. And since we're here talking about us, just asking, are they just not here? Are they just not 
promotable yet? You know, what's that process? Because I haven't seen that here. And I guess and my next question is, um, since nothing that's going on right now is new, it's just that we have cameras and footage from people just all over the place. So nothing is new. The, the killings, lynching, fights, rioting, that's not new. So I guess my question is, has the city of Louisville Police Department had any type of sensitivity training since all this stuff has happened over the course of a year since it's been so public? Have y'all had any, we call them come to Jesus meetings, have y'all have, have come in and had sensitivity training or had some type of uh, inclusional conversations about what's going on because guess what? Coming to a theater near you, you never know. People move out of their areas to other areas and they sometimes bring mentalities with them. So what are you doing to maybe promote from within you know, other races because it's obvious that it's populated heavily by one demographic and sensitivity training, and that's all I have. All right, uh, so I'll start off with the sensitivity uh, training question. So uh, I do have employee meetings that, that I do every quarter, and we've talked about some of that in my last quarterly meeting. Unfortunately, we've had to put off all of our training because of COVID. Uh, so it's extremely difficult right now to do it uh, other than mandatory training. Uh, the, the one part about your question, so um, Melinda kind of talked about it last week that, you know, when she first started with the city, there wasn't that many black officers that even worked here. There wasn't any when she started. So as we get more and more people that move up into the rank, I think you will start seeing that. But it takes time to, you know, move up through the rank, especially when you start from nothing. So I, I think we will get there. We're making strides, strides to get there. And the other part of your question was uh, defunding the police and s oh, okay. You had mentioned uh, civilian oversight. <laughs> She's trying to get rid of the mic and I'm giving no, it back. No, I just know that when um, she mentioned, um, she mentioned the defunding and reallocating funds into the community and having some you know, citizens involvement, my brain immediately went to, of course, where I came from, city of Dallas, and understanding that they have, and my knowledge of people that work there, my relationships, is that they have a citizen review board and they sit alongside the police officers and review camera footage and actions and so forth. That way it helps the community build trust because they have people within the community sitting with the officers, not telling them what to do, but just giving a different perspective and having a dialogue. That's all that was. Okay. Yeah, I, I think there are some things we can do there. Uh, the issue with, with civilian oversight is, you know, what does that look like? How is it composed? What authority do they have? And, you know, the other gentleman talked about a police union. If we had civilian oversight, we would get a police union because they're going to, the officers are going to want that protection from the, the civilian side of things. So I think that, uh, you know, there's no perfect fit for every department. And I think if we're handling things like we need to handle them, which I think we're doing a good job of, there's certainly some things we could do differently. But what fits Dallas may not fit Louisville. Okay, we have a question through chat from Winston Edmondson. My question is about hiring and promotions. I think it's important for the department to have autonomy. Has the city manager or the mayor or anyone on the council ever tried to influence which candidates get hired or rejected or which officers get promoted or passed over? Maybe not even explicitly, but are they allowed to give their opinions on those matters? No. <laughs> I, I can do a one-word answer there, no. I, I've never experienced that in my career. Okay, it's my turn. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll be real quick. Guys, I'm, I'm 66 years old, 
And uh, I saw something on the video uh, that can make us very uncomfortable. And I think it was a good thing, Chief and the, and the officials, to talk about segregation and the uh, Jim Crow laws, the way police officers were supposed to uh, reinforce those racial things. And that's, uh, that's how a lot of the mistrust started, started probably started before then. But, but that was a major deal. And I think someone said that the, uh, the best way to do something like that is to get it all out there and see what we're dealing with. And uh, as far as you look at those statistics, uh, I like them. I think it tells a, a big story uh, that the, uh, the police department cannot solve every problem that we have in any community nor can the, uh, the city, because you guys have limited resources, and your job is to govern and not necessarily to be social workers, but I'm also happy that you guys are spending money for people who are mentally trained, and you are doing a lot to de-escalate. And then I, my, one of my questions is, uh, what do you see going forward in the continual training as far as de-escalation. De yeah, I, I think there will be some, some different training that comes out in law enforcement uh, along those lines. You know, how can we, we're always looking at ways to do things better. I think de-escalation training will change just like the response to resistance changed away from continuums because they realized that part of it didn't work. How can we do it better? I think we're gonna, we'll, we'll continue to do that as we move forward. And, and, and I think the, the biggest thing as far as trust is, you know, and I get what uh, Commissioner Mitchell said on, on the first week that, you know, when, when her kid, she told her kid whenever they were stopped by the police officers to not say or do anything, call her. And I know that, that is still, that message is still being relayed out there. And I get it because back then you didn't have a witness. You wanted a witness for your child. Now, if every police department, and they're expensive, will have body-worn cameras, that child's witness. Because there's no way to tamper with it. And we, we see things, as, as we talked about, from our own reviews that has gotten people fired. So that is your witness, and I think as as law enforcement progresses, that technology is going to improve. Uh, there's technology now where the taser can have a camera on it. There's technology somewhat where uh, cameras can be put on the weapons, the, the firearm, because what, what happens sometimes is depending on where the body-worn camera is, it may block the view of it. And, you know, it's, it's one-dimensional. It doesn't tell the whole story. But the more cameras you get out there, the, the more, I think, will increase the, the trust of police. And I guess one of the most proudest things that I saw was being a black male, but I guess because I'm older, gray hair, I mean, I have some of the issues of young, young black male, but they still part of our community and our sons and grandsons that you guys don't go and react to someone calling when a black male is walking the street, he could be walking to a job or exercising or thing like that, that you guys don't, you know, don't pursue that if there's no criminal, criminal things going on. So I think that uh, I'm proud that you guys are doing that, and we appreciate that. I believe Calvin Dorsey has another comment to make. Mr. Dorsey? Yes, sir. I've got a question for the chief. Chief, I might have missed this. Did you show any research on the number of people who are ticketed by race, meaning people who are ticketed yet not arrested? I don't have that for tickets, but I do have it for traffic stops. So for uh, traffic stops, 46% white, 24% black, 22% Hispanic, 8% Asian Pacific Islander, and all the other ones were less than 1%. Any other questions in the room? Questions, comments, suggestions, ideas? On the screen, we have anybody on the screen? Oh. 
Oh, wait, wait, microphone, microphone. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you captured that those 33% or the 33 people that you had arrested, you were gonna, you're going to bring a breakdown to us next week? Yes. As to, I just want to make sure we captured that. What? We were talking we're about. We're going to break down the, the arrest of, more of, detailed um, about what types of offenses, male, okay. female, yes. if we can do hometown. So, yes, we're going to do a more detailed breakdown on that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And I can't tell uh, Pastor Cox's story. Everyone's left. Uh, but, real quickly, what he did for us that was, what was really <laughs> neat to see, and, and we didn't have everything that, that was needed to, to pull it off perfectly, but he may do. And, and got the point across, but he wrote something down, and, and he may remember what it was. It was something like, uh, do not feed the hungry alligators. But some of the words were written in different colors. And the, the point of the thing is, uh, people put on RBG glasses that knock out certain colors. So you see, like, don't feed the hungry. And you see other people have different things that they see. And you had to go through and, and talk about what you were seeing and defend questions that he would ask you about each one. Like, why would, would, you, would you give it food? And one side's thinking, would you give hungry people food? And the other side's thinking, would you give a hungry alligator food? or whatever, but the point of it was that everyone has filters, and, and it was kind of kind of neat to hear it from, from that way. You know, we can be looking at the exact same thing, but because of our biases that we all have, we all see things in a different way. So I, I thought that was very powerful. Thank you. Hey, last call for any comments in the room or online. If you think of something later, email me. We'll get it into the notes. We'll get it into the, the research process. But last call around the room. Okay, next week, general government. That'll be purchasing, economic development, communication, and neighborhood services. It will be a shorter presentation. Um, I can guarantee that. Uh, but thank you very much. We got some really good notes out of this. And uh, be safe going home. We'll see you in a week.